Could it be in our modern world there's an ancient philosophy that's infiltrating the minds of millions? One of my good friends is a flat earther, yes. Tons of boys at my school. Kind of caught me by surprise when I found out, but yeah. I think it's definitely a cultural trend. And with more Christians converting to this idea than at any other time in history, it's having a huge impact. I think it's a danger individually. I think it's a danger to the church. I think it's a danger to the creation science movement. Are you equipped to give an answer to those that believe? Why the earth is round. Very hard to explain that. I don't. Got me right there. Huh. The creation guys take this issue head on. Most of the evidences that they use for the flat earth mm -hmm. are actually rescuing devices. Yeah. Tackling the biblical case. And it's almost as if this was meant to refute the flat earth movement. The scientific evidence. Buoyant forces are well understood in terms of the conventional understanding of gravity. And performing some amazing experiments. One, let go. As they debunk the flat earth. If there's drop away occurring, that can't occur on a flat plane. Join special guests, Victor Brewer of Aerial Image Solutions. God never said go out and preach the flat earth. Hebrew expert Dr. Stephen Boyd of Calvary University. The flat earth movement is in trouble. Dr. Danny Faulkner, astronomer with answers in Genesis. I think the Bible is not a flat earth document whatsoever. And Apollo 16 astronaut, General Charlie Duke. The evidence is overwhelming that we landed on the moon six times. Faith on the Edge, exploring the biblical and scientific case against the flat earth. A full length documentary that will change the way you see the world. Available on DVD or video on demand. Get your copy today at thecreationguys.com. Hey, what's up, everybody? We are live, Flat Out Insights. We've got a crazy show for you guys tonight. We've got so many people here. We're going to be discussing Faith on the Edge, the Creation Guys documentary that just came out against Flat Earth. So tonight we've got Nathan Thompson, Rob Skiba, Robbie Davidson, Michael Solomon. We're going to be joined by Rick Hummer, Chad Taylor, and Daryl Lee. So we've got a full packed house. And uh, just really quickly, I wanted to let you guys know, everybody that's on the show tonight is going to be at Take on the World 19. And uh, if you guys don't know what that is, Take on the World 19 uh, is a full-fledged biblical conference that we talk about pretty much topics that nobody in the church is going to cover. And biblical cosmology is one of those topics. So if that's what you're interested in, uh, we've got a lot of that. We've got a lot of other things uh, for you guys to be involved in with there. So check out takeontheworld19.com. And uh, the other thing what that I want to share with you guys is Nate Wolf was supposed to be on this call tonight, but pray for Nate Wolf. He's sick right now. Uh, he said he would be here, but he feels like he's dying. So <laughs> he's not literally dying. He just feels like it. So, um, but yeah, without further ado, um, I think we're all kind of in shell shock after watching that documentary. So, yeah. oh man, where, where do we start? Uh, you know, I feel like starting with a punching bag. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so frustrated. Uh, you know, I've seen it twice now. It was even worse the second time around. I don't know if I could stomach yeah, I, that twice. No, it was it was tough. Hey, I'll say this before we start. A lot of the premises of of the of the biblical principles that these guys hold, um, you know, we believe, and you are not going to necessarily uh, knock them as individuals, but we're going to come after and give a critique of what they said in the film and what they showed in that film. So. Um, hopefully you guys take this in love and, uh, you know, so we have a really, you know, hopefully a good, uh, working relationship with everybody that's on either side of the spectrum. So we'll just get that out of the way. Now let's say some things that they may not like you to hear. So, <laughs> um, real quick, I think I one thing, Chris, yeah, go for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You made, some, free you made some claims about flat earthers and being somebody who's met 3000 flat earthers, I think more than anyone in the community. Um, they said uh, that flat earth moves upward. Nobody in flat earth believes flat earth moves upward. No nobody. one. Nobody. The second thing they said is some people think stars are above the firmament. Some people think they're below the firmament. No. I don't know. 
anybody who thinks stars are below the firmament. Then they said that uh, flat earthers think all astronauts are Freemasons. I don't really know anybody who thinks that either. So they keep <laughs> misrepresenting us. They just misrepresented us all around. And I just want to say that it's such a shame that they couldn't pick our actual arguments. You right. know? So. Yeah. yeah, well, you know, I would say is regarding the stars, because so the sun, moon, and stars are in the firmament. And right. the question of in, is it in as in the peppermint is in the candy, or in as in we are sitting in the room that we are sitting in? Um, I tend more toward the latter. So in that case, I would say that the sun, moon, and stars are inside or in under the firmament in right. that sense. Um, there are others who would say that it's probably actually embedded in the firmament. And, you know, I mean, I've heard both arguments, but I would be in the camp that would say sun, moon, and stars are in the firmament the same way we are in the room that we are sitting in right now. But you're right. I mean, so many of their other arguments, and I'm like, really? You're going to go with the upward floating disc? You're going to do that, right? Many secular flat earthers believe that the disc is rapidly accelerating upward to simulate gravity. You know what I thought was great was when they asked all the round earthers and they kept saying round and round over and over again, but the globe right. earthers, how do you prove it's a globe without, you know, using space? And they couldn't do it. No. They were stumbling for words and proofs and evidence because they don't have any. Yeah, you know, it was interesting that some of them were actually questioning the shape of the earth. Yeah. And then almost all of them. Um, had friends or family that believed that the Earth was flat. Right. And then it was also interesting that they couldn't defend their own observable um, facts on why the Earth is round. Well, you know, um, I'm going to do a screen share here, uh, just jump right in. One of the first scriptures that they threw out, and first of all, I want to say I'm really frustrated with these guys. They're, they call themselves creation guys. They call themselves a ministry. That I will say to their credit, though, that they had sent me the script uh, for the Bible portion. Uh, and the reason they did that is because they, in their words, they said, we don't want to misrepresent what you guys believe. We don't want to launch into a straw man argument. So can you look this over and let us know if we've accurately represented the scriptures the way you guys understand it? Well, when I got the script, I mean, it was less than five pages in length. And this is a two hour documentary. We're going to talk about what the Bible has to say. Mike, you guys are giving, what, 10 to 15 minutes in a two-hour documentary to the Bible, and you guys call yourself a creation ministry? <laughs> I got a problem with that. And and I told him, I said, look, I'm going to prophesy right here, right now, because he told me up front that they were doing a doc documentary to debunk Flat Earth. I said, okay, I'm going to prophesy right now that what you're going to do with the Scriptures, and the only thing you can do, with the scriptures is to say it's all allegorical uh, metaphorical poetry and sure enough that's exactly what they did but one of the first scriptures that they pop they they put out was ecclesiastes 1 5 talking about the sun rises and sets what about all the verses that talk about the sun rising and setting like ecclesiastes 1 5 which says the sun also ariseth and the sun goeth down and hasteth to his place where he arose if the sun literally rises and sets that contradicts the flat earth model, which says it travels in a continual circle above the earth. See, the Bible says the sun rises and sets. Well, no, the English translations say that. But if you actually look into the, the Hebrew of what's being said there for rises, it's this word right here, zarach, zarach, something like that means come forth. <laughs> and, and setting means to come and go. It's the word bow. Strong's number 934, mm. bow, to come in, go, to come and go. Well, that's what we believe. We believe right. the sun comes and goes. Um, yeah. And it's our perspective, the same way an airplane looks like it rises from the horizon over our heads and then goes down, and it's still cruising at 30,000 feet. You know, it's, it's flying flat and straight and level over 30,000 feet above us, but our perspective makes it look like the plane rises and sets and all it did is come and go well, that's what the scriptures say it's, it's, it comes and goes um they use psalm 113 3 later in the documentary they say that it only appears to set it's an illusion of this 
which is it? Is it literally true? I mean, God never says in his word, well, the sun appears to set or the sun appears. No, he says the sun rises and the sun sets. They're grossly inconsistent how they treat that. So verses about the rising and setting of the sun aren't taken literally by most Christians who believe in the flat earth. And same thing, you look up the Hebrew for that, and when it talks about, when we go back and read the scripture there, um, I'll use King Jimmy, from the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same. Okay, well, what's being said there? The place of where the sun rises. In other words, the reference is the east. So it should say, so from the east to where the sun sets. East, look at all the places it's used, east, east, east. Well, that's appropriate. That we believe the sun rises in the east, sets in the west. And then for the word uh, going down, it's a, a derivative of the other word, bo. It's, it's mabo, entrance coming in, entering. Interestingly enough, if you look and see some of the other references, uh, you see like in Proverbs 8, 3, same word, of the city at the coming in at the doors. Entrance, you know, men enter, entrance. That, so it doesn't mean rise and set. Our English translators put that in there, rise and set. But the Hebrew words used there are either the place of the east, where the sun just happens to rise from, or it goes down in the west. You know, it's not saying that the sun is actually going up or coming down. It's it's saying that it's coming and going, which, well, that's what we believe. <laughs> uh, I think so, the word you used, Rob, was phenomenological. It's how it appears to our eyes. Yeah, well, I want to address that, too. Um Here's a documentary uh, called Is Genesis History? And, uh, and right now I'm just going to take on Dr. Stephen Boyd because he's kind of talking two-faced here. Here's a clip from that documentary uh, with Dr. Boyd talking about how we should understand Genesis. Since Genesis was written in Hebrew, I wanted to talk to a Hebrew expert. What was actually in the original text? <clears throat> The first word in Genesis is Breshit. Breshit, Genesis 1 1 is Breshit bara Elohim et Hashemayim ve'aretz. So this is the beginning of the Toledot of, uh, of Noah. Just think that that word Toledot is a very interesting word. It's translated sometimes as genealogy, sometimes it's translated history. And what follows then is the account of the flood. Mm -hmm. Steve, it seems that there is a lot of history in the Bible. Is that how you see it? Is it? Oh, absolutely. In fact, the first thing is that it's an accurate historical account. Mm -hmm. the, the presentation is such, uh, and the perspective of the writers, that they believe they were talking about real events. Okay. It's, very, it's very obvious that because of the way in which uh, they in, insist that the next generation learn, you know, learn mm -hmm. their history. When you look at these early chapters in Genesis, what do you see? Can you take us through this? It starts with, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. There's, there's no word in Hebrew for universe. That means he created everything. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing we find in Genesis 1-2, we find a water ball that is in <laughs> God in subsequent days is going to fill that. <laughs> Do you see what he did? What water ball? First of all, yeah. he, he, he debunks his own words in the other documentary where he says it's phenomenological and it's metaphorical and it's poetic language. He says Genesis is history. To help us think through these things, Kyle and Pat decided to get a hold of Dr. Stephen Boyd. Dr. Boyd has a Master's of Science in Physics from Drexel University. He also has a Master's of Theology in Semitics and Old Testament from Dallas Theological Seminary, and a Doctorate of Philosophy in Hebraic and Cognate Studies from Hebrew Union College. He's currently the Professor of Bible and Theology at Calvary University in Kansas City, Missouri. Dr. Boyd, thank you so much for being here today. It's a, a, a pleasure to have you. Uh, I enjoy being here. Dr. Boyd, you know, a lot of the people who believe in a flat earth, they start using these verses, but is there some misconceptions going on as far as what the original Hebrew is talking about? I think you have to be careful to understand what is the genre, what type of literature are you looking at? Steve, it seems that there is a lot of history in the Bible. Is that how you see it? Is it? Oh, absolutely. In fact, the first thing is that it's an accurate historical account. Mm -hmm. the, the presentation is such, uh, and the perspective of the writers, that they believe they were talking about real events. Okay. It's very, it's very obvious that 
because of the way in which uh, they in insist that the next generation learn, you know, learn mm -hmm. their history. The language in Genesis 1 is phenomenological language. What does it appear like to our eyes? That it's an accurate historical account. Mm -hmm. Written as history, and other, I could play a whole bunch of clips from that documentary where he makes the solid case because they're they're arguing against evolution here. So all of a sudden now they're being very literal, and day means day, right? It's not a long age, so you can't stretch Genesis to justify long periods of time for evolution. A day means a twenty-four hour time, but a day means day. So and he makes the case that Genesis is a literal historical uh, account. It's not metaphorical. It's not phenomenological. It's not poetry. It is literal. And then he comes out and says, the first thing we see is a ball floating in space. The next thing we find in Genesis 1-2, we find a water ball that is in <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. Like, I would challenge anybody in the audience out there right now to go pick up a Bible, read Genesis 1, and show me a ball floating in space. <laughs> anywhere in <Genesis> 1 <laughs> a ball of water, no less. A ball of water floating in space. So, wow. So this guy's got some problems, um, and I think anybody, I hate to say it, but anybody with a doctorate degree and letters after the name runs into the same problem. They get stuck by their own cognitive dissonance with yeah. whatever their preconceived bias is, whatever they believe going into it, they impose upon the text, even when they're trying to make a scholarly case for what the text actually says. You know, they're throwing their own stuff into it. Uh, yeah, okay. Then when he goes to Isaiah forty twenty two. He says, this is high level poetry. I know one of the other verses that I've seen them using a lot is Isaiah forty twenty two, where it says that uh, he sitteth upon the circle of the earth. And then they go back and show that that Hebrew word, which I believe is hug, actually means circle and does not mean a sphere. But what would you say to that? How do you answer that verse? Well, I've got it uh, right here. The one who sits upon the circle of the earth its inhabitants are like grasshoppers when it extends out uh, like a thin substance the heavens and he stretches them out like a tent for dwelling. This is extremely high level poetry. But it also includes phenomenological language because if you are out on the water or up on a flat area where there's no trees, the horizon is circular. The big thing about this verse and this whole chapter in Isaiah 40 is talking about the immensity of God and how small we are in comparison. So like Dr. Boyd has pointed out, Isaiah 40.22 is in a passage that's using metaphorical and phenomenological language to communicate the greatness of God. Well, that's convenient. <laughs> Except Isaiah 40.21 says, haven't you heard, have it not been told to you from the beginning, i.e. Genesis? So Isaiah's referencing in the previous verse, Genesis is the setup for the next verse. Have you not heard, has not been told to you from the beginning? That it is he that sits on the circle of the earth. And, and Solomon and both Solomon and Job said that circle was inscribed. Well, if you look up the Hebrew word inscribed, it means it's kalkak. It means to cut chisel into stone, like to carve something into something solid. So how do you carve a ball into space? You know, this guy wants to say it's phenomenological poet, you know, high level poetry. I'm sorry. I can't accept that. He's wrong. I'm, I'm going to stand against these people. Uh, he goes out and says that it's metaphorical. Yeah, it is. And in, in the next part of the verse, he says the heavens are stretched out as a tent, like a tent, as a tent. Right. Guess what? That's a metaphor, right? That's a simile. Well, if you're going to employ the use of a simile or a metaphor, don't you think it helps to say something that would at least remotely paint a picture in the listener's mind of whatever it is you're trying to convey? Well, when he used the word tent, what do you think everybody who heard him say that thought? Well, they thought about a stretched out piece of fabric or a flat surface. <laughs> you know, and, and that backs up what David said in Psalm 19, that, the, the, he, that God made a tabernacle, a dwelling place for the sun, and the sun moves in a circuit. Sun moves in a circuit, not the earth. <laughs> and these creation ministries who are taking spinning a heliocentric Copernican model cosmology and forcing it onto the text, I'm standing against you. I'm rebuking you because you're liars. You're lying to yourself and you're lying to everybody who you're pushing this garbage through. I'm sorry I'm getting so fired up, but this documentary is getting pushed, you know, like the, the big, you know, answer to everything, you know, to try to debunk what we're saying here. 
and these guys are full of crap. That's it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable to me that they would use verses like, you know, God is clearly not a rock. And we're oh. talking about creation and they use the most ridiculous things to show a parallel between the fact that we can't take it literal and going so far as saying that uh, these verses don't add up and using stuff like, you know, Jesus is a door or, you know, God is a rock. I mean, that is just blatantly uh, deception, in my opinion, when you start kind of moving away. They don't really tackle all the verses that flat earthers bring up. They bring in the Rakia and stuff. But I mean, there are so many. They even mentioned there's like 200. What did they mention? Two? They went through two verses and all the rest were complete nonsense. I mean, it's it's absolutely it's deplorable to me that a biblical creation group would come forward and put a two-hour documentary together. Number one, spend 17 minutes on the Bible, but number two, have no biblical flat earthers in it to get their perspective. <laughs> yeah, what a shame. Yeah, they use the word raka. You know, he wants to say raka to spread out. Dr. Boyd, I've noticed that it uh, seems like in Genesis 1 where it's talking about the firmament, that the firmament is actually a dome uh, that's over the earth. So what is the firmament actually? What's Genesis telling us about that? Well, the verb raka, which the noun is rakia for expanse, raka, it simply means to spread something out. Now in the derived stem, in the PL stem, it can mean to peen something, to hammer something flat. So I would think the idea of an expanse would be a good translation for that. So rakia simply means expanse. But using an uncalled for derivation of rakia from the verb rika, which means to pound flat, flat earthers make the case that God formed the firmament out of a hard material, maybe similar to bronze. But again, the actual word rakia used in this passage simply means an expanse. Now, having said that, the language in Genesis 1 is phenomenological language. What does it appear like to our eyes? Now, there was no human witness for creation, right? There was nobody there. So God is describing things in terms of what it would look like if there was a man standing there and looking at it. So it's this big blue expanse that is overhead and all around you. In Hebrew, Shemayim, the word for heaven, Shemayim, does not distinguish between the atmosphere, the celestial space, and God's abode. It's all called Shemayim. Where God lives is Shemayim. Where the stars are, Shemayim. Where the birds fly, Shemayim. All that is referred to as the rakia, the expanse. So see, rakia means expanse. Well, yeah, it means yeah, to spread out, but it means to hammer out, beat out metal. You know, uh, it, Job said the sky is like a molten looking glass. Proverbs, Solomon says that he made firm the skies above. So you have two internal witnesses to testify to what the meaning of the word used in Genesis is. You know, if you want to say that the Hebrew word is somehow ambiguous, I'm sorry, you can't do that. The raka means to beat out like metal. You can you can look elsewhere, like the, pound out the, the metal for the labor in the temple. Uh, you know, wherever else it's used, it's talking about pounding out like metal and stretching it out. Where we know that God stretched out the heavens, because that's what he did. He pounded it out. How do you pound out air? How do you pound out gas and the vacuum of space? That doesn't work. But if you still want to maintain that rakia is somehow an ambiguous word that can just simply mean expanse, gas, air, and the vacuum of space, then you got a big problem when you get to the Septuagint because the Hebrew scholars, 70 of them, no less, 70 Hebrew scholars separated into 70 separate rooms independently chose the exact same <laughs> word, right? When King Ptolemy said, hey, Jews, you know, write to me the Torah of your, your prophet Moshe, you know, and, you know, it's upon pain of death, right? You know, these guys are sitting in rooms going, oh, geez, you know, this guy's you know. <laughs> independently, 70 guys separated in 70 different rooms chose the, the appropriate Greek equivalent word to represent their understanding of the Hebrew word rakia. So when the when they and that's why I love the Septuagint because you may say that Hebrew uh, and it can be in many ways somewhat ambiguous with many different uh, you know um, abstract uh, definitions. Greek is not like that. Greek is a lot more specific, and they had a, a there's something like eight thousand Hebrew words, and there's way more than that in Greek. So they had a, a big um, bucket of words to choose from, and they chose the word stereoma which even more so conveys solidity, uh, and it is used as a foundation. It's the type of word you would use for laying the foundation of a house. It's solid. It's, you know, you don't build your house on sinking sand. You build it on a solid structure, right? So they use the word stereoma, and then Jerome comes along and does the Latin Vulgate, and he chose the word firm 
momentum from which we later get the English word firmament. So in Hebrew, in Greek, in Latin, and in English, this is a solid structure. You can't turn it into space. I'm sorry, Danny Faulkner, you're wrong. I'm sorry, Dr. Boyd, you're wrong. I'm sorry, everybody in a creation ministry who's trying to push this stuff, you're wrong. And I'm clearly, you. you know, first of all, I, I posted a, 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 uh, a note on Facebook called Pay No Attention to the Village Idiot. And I, I said, so apparently I've now earned the reputation as the Facebook village idiot these days and probably YouTube as well, at least according to the Internet talk show buzz. I've heard uh, some people tell me that they're mocking me on various radio talk shows and stuff like that, bringing my name up. And, of course, the wildly active gossip mill is uh, chiming in as well. And um, I, I about the time that I was becoming aware of how much my name is being drugged through the mud – I found an article written by Dr. Michael Heiser. It was written about three years ago. In the article, he wrote, uh, literal creationists are actually only selective literalists, or as I would call them, inconsistent literalists. If one was truly consistent in interpreting the creation description of Genesis 1 at face value, along with other creation descriptions in both Testaments, you'd come out with a round, flat earth complete with solid dome over the earth and earth supported by pillars with Sheol underneath, etc. But creationists who claim the literal mantle don't do that, since the results are clearly non-scientific. My view, this is Dr. Michael Heiser now, as readers know, is that we ought to simply let the text say what it says and let it be what it is. It was God's choice to prompt people living millennia ago to produce this thing we call the Bible. And so we dishonor it if we impose our own interpretive context on it. Our modern evangelical contexts are alien to the Bible. Frankly, any context other than the context in which the biblical writers were moved to write is foreign to the Bible. So who's the literalist now, he says? I've pointed out this inconsistency before for ex in, for example, my online lecture about Genesis and its pre-scientific cosmology. What Genesis describes is consistent with all other ancient Near Eastern creation models and shares the vocabulary and motifs of those other pre-scientific cosmologies. That's Dr. Michael Heiser. Now, if you want to get to know who this guy is, you can check him out on Logos.com. Go to Logos.com for Logos Bible Software. Logos.com forward slash academic forward slash bio forward slash Heiser. And uh, you'll see he earned his Ph.D. in Hebrew Bible and Semitic Languages at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Before going to UW-Madison, Mike earned an M.A. in Ancient History from the University of Pennsylvania, major fields were ancient Israel and Egyptology, and another MA from the University of Wisconsin-Madison Hebrew Studies. He also attended Dallas Theological Seminary. Mike's undergraduate degree is from Bob Jones University, but he also attended Bible College for three years. Mike's dissertation was entitled, The Divine Council in Late Canonical and Non-Canonical Second Temple Jewish Literature. The dissertation sought to discern the ancient Canaanite and Israelite roots of Jewish binitarian monotheism and the early church's high Christology. Because of his coursework, Mike can do translation work in roughly a dozen ancient languages, among them Biblical Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, Egyptian, hieroglyphs, and Ugaritic cuneiform. He has also studied Akkadian and Sumerian independently. Okay, so... I mean, you can, he's got more to that bio. I mean, there's like one, two, three, four more paragraphs you can read on the guy. He's a highly educated individual. Okay. Um, he's a biblical scholar. He's a, a Semitic language expert with letters after his name. He's like the go-to guy for ancient Near Eastern languages and cultural contexts that nearly everyone around here uh, in the internet community, they all like to go run to this guy for validation of biblical Hebrew and Greek concepts. Often they'll do so while uh, mocking me in the process, a pastime that even he has engaged in on more than one occasion. And yet, he has said exactly what I've been saying regarding the cosmology of the ancient world. 
even though I've never consulted anything that he's ever written on this issue until just recently. That's right. Believe it or not, I actually done come to that same conclusion all by my silly self, and I did so without searching and spending tens of thousands of dollars to read them fancy books so that I can get some of them pretty pieces of paper to hang on my wall. Yeah, somehow I managed to come to the same conclusion all by myself without spending all that money to go to school. But if you don't want to listen to the village idiot, then at least listen to Dr. Michael Heiser. Let's get into it here. Exodus 24. Israelite cosmology has three tiers. This is the Ten Commandments passage. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Three levels. New Testament is the same. Philippians 2.8, verse 10. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. What, like the worms? No. We're going to see what they were thinking here. Revelation 5, heaven, earth, under the earth. It's a three-tiered cosmology. This is what it would look like. I didn't make this graphic, which is why it looks cool. Okay. Somebody gave this to me because they hated, honestly, at Western, uh, they, they hated the one I used, and so they gave me this one. This is a three-tiered cosmology. There's God. We're going to see it in the verses. I'll show you that God lives above the vault of heaven, the firmament. And in the firmament, you have windows and doors. And you have the earth. We're going to see verses that talk about the ends of the round, flat earth here. Underneath is Sheol. Sheol can be both the grave, and it can also be the underworld. Okay, it's, it's not quite hell, but it's sort of like hell. We can talk a little bit about it. And then underneath that, we have the great deep. These are all scriptural terms that are on this map. This is what an Israelite, an, Egypt, an Egyptian would have had different terms, but the same three-tiered level, same with the Mesopotamians. Now, they have, theologically, they have dramatically different views of what's going on here, not just who made it, but what's going on. Views of afterlife, the value of humanity. I mean, it's, it's dramatically different. And I've made the comment before, Genesis is about theological messaging. And there are some dramatic differences in what Israel is saying, the Bible is saying, and anything else. So let's take a look at the parts. Waters above and below the heavens. Genesis 1.6, God said, let there be an expanse some translations have firmament, it's rakiah in Hebrew, in the midst of the waters. And let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse, the rakiah, and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And what was that expanse called? Heaven. The heavens, the sky, shemayim in Hebrew. So you have here the sky, okay, and you have waters above the sky, and of course you've got waters below down here, but then you have you know, the atmospheric heavens as well. Psalm 148 mentions the waters that are above the heavens. That's after the flood. Did you catch that? Because a lot of people want to say, oh, the waters above, they went away with the flood. See, the, 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 the firmament was this canopy thing, and it was there, and then the flood, it just went away. And... No. It wasn't. According to the psalmist, it's, he's still referring to it. Proverbs 8. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep. Isn't that interesting? We'll get to that. Circle on the face of the deep. When he made firm the skies above. Made firm is amats in Hebrew. It is the same verb for letting a tree grow firm, hard. Ancient cosmology across the board believed that the sky was this dome over the earth, and it was solid. Kind of like the Truman Show. Okay? They believed that the stars were affixed to it. Some of the stars never moved, but other ones did. And the ones that did, this is why... 
The word stars is attributed to the sons of God and to angels in biblical literature. They believed that the stars were animate beings, that they were really divine beings, and then they'd come to earth as angels, but they, were, they lived up there. And those were the ones that moved. Why? Because movement shows what? If something moves, it's alive. Okay? Again, they can't take a rocket and go up and check it out. They, they believe that this is their... their there's a solid expanse over them. Another passage. Job 37, verse 18. Can you, like him, you know, speaking of Job, you know, drawing the dramatically poor comparison of God and Job, of course we know who's going to win there, but can you, like him, spread out the skies hard, kazakh, hard as cast metal, mutsak, as a metal mirror, mutsak, is the same word used in the casting of the laver, you know, the tabernacle where they would wash. It's solid. It's also the same terminology used for flint rock. Again, these passages point to the belief that there's a dome, the sky's a dome, and it's solid. And God lives above it, we live below it. Job 22, did I skip one? Did I? No, I didn't. <clears throat> but you say, what does God know? Can he judge through the deep darkness? Thick clouds veil him so that he does not see, and he walks on the vault of heaven. That's where God lives. It's his address. You know, and b before we, we think, oh, that's quaint. How cute. We think that, don't we? If a little child would ask you, where does God live? Up there. Is there something wrong with that answer? I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Use it, you know. Uh, because there's the sense that God lives off planet. Why? Because he created the earth for us. He doesn't need it. He's independent of it. He transcends it. That's all it is. It's very normal. Amos 9.6, he builds his upper chambers in the heavens and founds his vault upon the earth. The vault upon the earth who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out in the surface of the earth. The Lord is his name. And Psalm 29, the Lord sits enthroned over the flood. <clears throat> Let's go back here. We talk about the middle tier now, the earth. Here's a God's eye view of the world. If God is sitting above the firmament and looking down at it, what does he see? This is where we get Genesis 1.9. God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place. Waters, plural, one place. How can you get all the waters in one place and then still call them seas? And the dry land appeared. <coughs> That's how you get it. All the waters, one place, earth, but they're still seas. Again, depending on what direction you're coming from or where you're at. Because if you're over here, you're going to call this something C, and you can't really see what's going on over here. So if you live on the other side, that's another C. But you got all the C's together. Proverbs 8, when he established the heavens, I was there when he drew a circle on the face of the deep. Circular. He made firm the skies above, so on and so forth. That's where I'll end that. So, clearly, Dr. Michael Heiser fully acknowledges that the Bible absolutely argues in favor of a still flat circular earth with a dome over it. I mean, let that sink in, guys. Go read this guy's bio. A Semitic language expert acknowledges that the Hebrews had the same cosmology as the ancient Near East, which was... Just the same way it's depicted in the Logos Bible software picture. Now, all the stuff that I've been referring to in this broadcast so far came as a result of me trying to confirm that Logos actually made that picture because I've used that picture quite a bit. And, you know, people uh, get creative with Photoshop sometimes. So I wanted to make sure that, that was a legitimate image created by Logos Bible software, which is a highly respected Bible tool software you know, program. 
So as I'm searching to confirm that that was in fact created by Logos Bible Software, I'm finding all these articles that I've been referring to in this broadcast so far, and then I found this video uh, of Michael Heiser saying that. But clearly, Rob, I mean, all this flat earth was created to come against the creation ministries. So, Kyle, we've discussed how the flat earth really isn't a salvation issue. Right. But it's causing some other problems, isn't it? It really is. Uh, it just everything we've been hearing is that it's dividing churches, uh, people are leaving, and so on. So there's some other things going on that really present some dangers to the believers, and we ask our experts what they thought. I think ultimately the, the Flat Earth Movement has some roots that are from the 19th century trying to discredit Scripture and trying to discredit Christianity and to make Christians look foolish. And certainly uh, the Christians do look foolish to the world. And it's not foolishness for Christ's sake. You know, we're fools for Christ, but uh, we're not foolishness for our own foolishness sake. That's a perversion of Scripture. We need to keep the balance proper and keep the truth proper in this. And I think the Flat Earthers largely have failed to do this on this front. It's an insidious attack, I think, against the creation ministries and against the belief in creation. They put up a straw man argument, well, you people claim to believe the Bible's literal, but you don't really take it literally, and here's why. It also can have a deleterious effect upon people. I've heard from individuals who they have, a, sometimes it's a spouse that's into this, and it's uh, really damaging to their marriage. It's been, uh, people have been in churches that have caused problems because they become very evangelistic about it. They get excited because they think they have found some deep, dark truth that they have found and they want to share it with people. And again, I understand that, but at the same time, it's false knowledge, folks. It's not true. I think it's a, a danger individually. I think it's a danger to the church. I think it's a danger to the creation science movement. It's a danger to Christianity and the authority of scripture. You notice how many times they actually said that? They had the audacity to say they're coming against good creation ministries, but also saying, and this was absolutely horrific when i heard them say this is detrimental to your understanding on salvation your understanding on the savior because he's infinite and you're bringing him closer and more personal the flat earth movement is in trouble in terms of what the scripture says about the majesty of god the exaltation of christ our salvation why do you think so many believers are are falling for this idea of the flat earth and why is it dangerous well, it's dangerous because once you start to diminish Christ because his uh, glory is only above the heavens and the heavens are so small, then I think what happens is you can easily fall into the idea that he's not far greater than we are. That's a real problem. I thought that was absolutely ridiculous reasoning, but anyways, I just couldn't <laughs> I, believe I how many like, times... That... Yeah, I was going to say, it makes, him more, it, makes it much more... Uh understandable that he made this a much more intimate place for us that he had us in mind that he's got us right here he's watching over us i mean sure hey guys i was i was late to the party here trying to get all logged in and uh, i have nine pages of notes that i've been scribbling down <laughs> Go for it, Go for it. it just oh what a pile of crap that was i, I <laughs> it, it's a mixture of anger and disgust at the same time well, uh, it's how you feel right it's just disgusting. It's horrific. And, you know, I'm, I'm really getting back uh, into music and, and that sort of things. And, and a lot of the lyrics I'm starting to jot down. Uh, one of them is called Gatekeepers. And Danny Faulkner comes to mind when in writing the song, it, it, the Gatekeepers. And somebody who, you know, he sat through my talk and he sat through other people's talks uh, in Denver at FEIC. And just the this subject to me um i don't know exactly where he stands but but to me it's like right at the very end of the show how you mentioned right. it the attack against creation ministries it's just it's all this attack against him and so any it's an attempt to discredit the creation ministries and all these different things it's an attempt to discredit him is how he sees it i, I would assume exactly it's just it's so it's his livelihood is at stake and so and where you stand with this and so with that's why i have so, so much respect for you rob is because back in 2015 you were willing to speak the truth even though it really <laughs> made it very difficult for your livelihood you you had the guts to do that and then so we're finding as time goes on do people have the guts to actually say okay even though i'm going to lose money even though a lot of people are going to look at me weird i'm willing to speak the truth and you know so this is I don't know. It's just appalling and disgusting at the same time. 
And but the a lot of this was just like kindergarten level arguments is is all it really was. But you know, the newest person coming along that sees these people, and if you pay attention, it's it's there's laughing in it. They have two doctors, you know, how many doctors does it take to debunk the Bible? You know, and they have uh, this nice gentle music and laughter and doctors and who, you know, of course they're right, you know, and that's, it's sickening. It's disgusting. And um, I'm going to try to watch my language because I'm kind of fired up over this one. I want to take it back to what, um, to Rob's, uh, those verses that you talked about, Rob, um, about the sun coming in and the, the sun coming forth. Um, you know, that level of either dishonesty or ignorance blows my mind because it, it, it literally takes you two minutes to look up those verses and, and look into what those, those words actually say when all we're using is those, those passages of Ecclesiastes. Is this literal? You guys, you guys are Bible literalists, but you know, here, you know, you're not literalists here, right? But it takes them two minutes just to open up Bible Hub and look at the lexicon and walk through those definitions and say, huh, maybe that doesn't mean what the translators, you know, translated it as. And that's a level of either complete dishonesty to their listeners or complete ignorance. And whatever which one it is, when you're putting out a documentary and spending lots of money to do that, and you and you miss a big fact check of which the most important thing is what you claim is the Bible – but yet you won't even fact check and take two minutes out and look at your argument and see if it has any validity or any weight when the actual Hebrew words tell you, no, it it doesn't mean what you think it means. And I think those King James English authors already had a preconceived notion of the sun dropping, you know, the sun going down and the sun coming up, but yet not a concept of coming forth. I believe Solomon who wrote Ecclesiastes would have known it because he was so wise that the sun came forth and didn't do what they, we all believe, you know, in heliocentrism. So I, I don't know if it's a level of dishonesty on purpose or just a level of ignorance on purpose because, wow, I mean, that was, I mean, that's amateur um, Bible stuff. Um, and these guys are supposed to be creating a documentary. You think you, you would dig just a little deeper. Yeah, yeah you, you're talking about Solomon. Solomon was the son of David, and David wrote Psalm 19, where he tells you that the sun is moving. The sun comes out as a bridegroom to run a race, and the sun completes its circuit from one end of heaven to the other. Okay? David knew that, and these guys, there was one point in there where they were saying, uh, you know, talk about trusting God's word and that, you know, when they're trying to make a stand against evolution and they're saying many times when they deal with people who want to believe in evolution, that they, they always have a rescue device. And one of the things that you and I have found mm -hmm. is that many times when there's a hole in their theory, mm -hmm. uh, they try and fill that hole yeah. with a rescuing device. So it's like, we can't figure this out. Hey, I have an idea. Right. right? Yeah. <laughs> and so it's a story that explains how it could have happened. But yeah. the problem is it's just a story without any data or facts to back it up. Right. Well, that's exactly what these guys did. They had a rescue device to justify their spinning heliocentric globular Earth belief um, mm -hmm. in, in, the, in, in the use of phenomenological language, poetry, and the doctrine of accommodation. That's their rescue device and lying and or omitting you know, easy, as you just said, Chris, easily verifiable and, and something you could just look up. It took me like all of a few seconds to go to Bible Hub and just look up those words and say, well, that, that doesn't mean come down and go. And you're right. The King James 1611 was written right at the very beginning of the Copernican Revolution, which just happened, you know, what, 50 years before that? I couldn't believe that they actually use an illustration showing evolution is just nothing but a story and a theory. There's no proof to back it up. And then equating it with flat earth in the same in the same context. Right. That was absolutely horrific. The fact that they would say that this is no, this is no better than evolution, because again, they knew that their audience are very against evolution. So if right. they're equating flat Earth with just basically being nothing more than evolutionists, and we know that evolutionists are trying to attack the creation ministries, right? They're coming at them. So these flat Earthers are coming at us as well. This is a damage control piece. This wasn't even honest in the sense of saying, let's look at this contextually outside of the realm of saying they're coming after Answers in Genesis. They're coming after us, good creation ministries that are trying to do good work. They equated evolution and flat earth in the same sentence. Yep. It was appalling, appalling. Mm -hmm.
Yeah. I thought it was interesting, guys, how they said, <laughs> oh, well, the Bible says the earth hangs on nothing. So that means it can't be on a foundation. Ironically, not every verse is taken literally in the flat earth model either. Job 26, 7 says, He stretcheth out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. If we take this verse literally, it means the earth can't be on a foundation. Um, I was like, <laughs> what, is, what is the Bible saying us hang, not hanging on anything have anything to do with the foundation, my dinner table in my kitchen doesn't hang on anything, but it still has a foundation. So they tried to equate us with like not hanging on anything with not having a foundation. And that's like a total red herring argument it has nothing to do with, with hanging. So that's, that's then, the biggest, that's the biggest verse they use other than Isaiah 40, 22. It's always that one. See space. It's hovering yeah, in space. Yeah. Well, they can't, they, can't, they can't, they can't use Job 26, seven for their model. If you I agree in the Copernican model, then the earth is literally hanging on the gravity of the sun. You can't get around that. So you can't mm -hmm. be a heliocentrist Copernican person and use Job 26, seven. You can't do that. You know, um, but how, what how is it? How is it? They can use two verses literally. And yet we can't use 250 literal. You know what I mean? You, you see, you see what's going on there. So if you're going to be fair, you can't use even those two verses because you just told us it's all allegory and all poetry. You are not yeah. even allowed to use those two verses. How dare you? We're saying we got 240, and you're saying no, we got these two. Well, wait a minute. You're telling us all of our verses are you know allegory, and yet you're saying look, look, look. It it hangs on nothing. It hangs on nothing. That is a double standard, and we need to call them out on that because that's ridiculous. Yeah. Because I thought it was supposed mm -hmm. to be poetry, but now you're telling us it's allegory. How do you know? How do you know? Yeah. Did it seem like they were making up big words just to confuse people, by the way? I don't know if you guys <laughs> noticed. <laughs> <laughs> that me, but I'm like, wow, hydrostatic equilibrium. Yeah, that explains uh, why you know, space doesn't uh, pull everything off. See, I mean, if, if they have such big words, they must be telling you the I'm truth. I'm surprised they weren't wearing white lab coats. I'm surprised yeah, they weren't right. wearing white lab coats in the documentary because that would just esteem yeah. them even further. Yeah, but you know, yeah, they, they would use these big words and they would and and you know have the doctor this and doctor that, and yet yeah. they would make some ridiculously stupid, incredibly insane statement like talking about east and west and our sins not being so far away on a flat earth. And believing in the flat earth also affects our understanding of Christ. In Hebrews 7.26, now we get into Christology. For it is indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, talking about Christ, holy, innocent, unsustained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens for what he did for mankind, becoming a man and then dying on the cross for our sins. This is talking about an infinite exaltation, not just a little exaltation. And not only does it minimize the work of Christ on the cross, but believing in a flat earth even affects our view of salvation. Let's move from Christology to Soteriology, talk about salvation. Psalm 103, verse 11, because as the heavens are high above the earth, so powerful is his grace to those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so he has a distance from us our rebellion. That's a very literal translation from the Hebrew. If we have a small area that the earth is, then our sins are not very far from us. But if you have a sphere, east and west, in terms of mathematical topology, are infinitely far from one another. This is saying God has separated our sins an infinite distance from us. What kind of encouragement would it be to somebody to say, well, you know, your sins are 2,000 miles away or 10,000 miles away. You could, you could almost see them. No, the idea, it's so far away, it's, they're gone. Guess what, knucklehead? East and West work exactly the same way on a circle as it does on a ball. <laughs> we should, we should start down. calling each other doctors. Well, you know, yeah, yeah, right, right. Hey, good, that's a good point, Dr. Chow. Well, you know what's so funny about that? Side note, side note on that verse, Rob, <laughs> just, just personally. We have a personal friend that came to Flat Earth, not through YouTube, not through a friend. She came to it with that verse. She tried to understand from the east to the west, and honestly, she became a flat earther. So just interesting side note, wow. we have a personal friend that came to it, not from YouTube, not a video, not even a friend. She was reading the Bible. She came across that, and that's her testimony. Wow. Wow. Well, the, the one thing that I want to share real quick, I mean, uh, this is uh, this is Job 38.5, right? Um, 
and uh, it says, who, who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest, or who has stretched out the line upon it? Uh, other other passages, you know, refer that as a, uh, a, a basically a measuring tape. Who can know the the measure of the earth, right? But yet we're we're supposed to, you know, they they talk about uh, you know how far it is from the east to the west, and they and they they come up with these all these crazy dimensions. But yet here, you know, we have solid evidence that the that the earth is what twenty four thousand nine hundred uh, you know miles circumference. Yet here in the scriptures. Who knows this? And this is this is you know this is so absurdly. Where is the fear of the Lord in 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 these men who trust the men, the the men of science, who have an exact number and answer for everything? When the scriptures tell you there is no answer for these things. Good point. When are we going to start standing up? When are we going to start standing up for the word of God? You know, this is this is. This is just crazy, and we're going to continue to trust the lies of these men. These creation ministries won't stand on the word at all, and yet still propose this 24,900 circumfer perfect circumference earth to perpetuate a lie. Well, you know, and yet, funny, Chris, I actually, I, actually, I actually had a chance to uh, speak to a well-known, uh, let's just say well-known science guy um, <laughs> uh, doing another production. And he flat out said, there's no way anyone could know the exact number because nobody's actually measured it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, the Bible says you cannot comprehend the height of heaven. And yet that one dude, I forget, was it Faulkner or one of those two doctors, whatever, um, you know, talking about, well, in this instance, it brings God so much closer and it diminishes uh, his, you know, his you know, authority or what it's just like the Bible says you cannot comprehend the height. It's not like we're yeah. saying yeah, it's like five miles right up there. Right there. No, we can't comprehend it. Very, 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 very tall, but it's not and some infinite space where he's just constantly going further and further and further away from us. Now we go to Isaiah 55, nine, and it's almost as if this was meant to refute the flat earth movement as the heavens are high above the earth. Thus, are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. In the flat earth movement, as I understand it, not only is the earth flat, the top of the dome isn't that high up. That's limiting the mind of God, the ways of God, the thoughts of God, which we do not want to do. <laughs> First of all, the, we know that there are multiple heavens. There's a firmament, which is also called heaven. The firmament's called heaven, but there's there's the sky, there's space, there's the firmament, and then there's where God dwells, which we call heaven. And how high is that? Like, uh -huh. what's above God's head? That's right. what people know. <laughs> OK, it doesn't say, you know, how high is the firmament? Can you declare how high the firmament is? I don't even think we're going to be able to ever even know that. But it doesn't even say that. It says, you know, how high are that? You know, his ways, the heavens, as high as the heavens are, whatever it was, you know, are, wow. so far his ways are above us. Well, how high is the sky above God? We don't know. I mean, right. these people, they, they don't have any critical thinking skills whatsoever. I mean, even when it comes to looking at the scriptures, it's like, yeah. That's your and, argument. And I'm I'm glad you brought that up, Rob, because I had something pop into my head, and I I think it was like a little download from God the other day, where it was exactly what you're talking about. Where in Revelation, I forget the exact verse, where it talks about you know the smoke from their torment will rise forever, right? Or or something. I'm paraphrasing, but I think that's almost verbatim. Is am I correct here? Yeah. It's about the smoke rising, going forever. up forever. So mm. you got to. Your question is, what's above God's head right now? Like. As he's on top of the firmament right now, what's above his head? Well, if the smoke rises forever, it must be pretty darn high forever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, yeah. So that it's, highest it's, heaven has apparently no limit to it. Well, that mm -hmm. also that goes back to Job 26, 7, too, because I believe eternity goes every way, up, way, down, sideways, backwards. Yes. Yes. So, you know, it, Scripture clearly says that, that God, you know, he asked Job, where were you when I laid the foundation? Yeah. Laid the foundation when I set the cornerstone and all that, right? So he 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 set this platform, uh, you know, up that he put pillars on that he put the earth on. But mm -hmm. what is that? What is the the base on? Like yeah. below that, like yeah. if eternity goes every way, 
you know, you know, I don't know. I don't have an answer to that. But you know, it, so we can use that verse too, Job twenty six seven, and it's not a problem for us. You know, the question it's a rhetorical question when you get into Job what's a thirty eight I think, where God's asking, hey Job, eh, where were you when I did this and when I did that? Can you declare it? No, he, the, 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 he's making a point of sorry, Job, you don't have a clue what you're talking about. You can't even begin to comprehend who I am and what I did. You know, yeah, when I laid a foundation, what I laid on. Can you can you tell me? Surely you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know. Right. Yeah, they they made it seem like having a yeah. permanent, let's say it's three thousand miles above our head, it takes away from God's majesty and makes his ways like less higher than they would be on a globe. But guys, we're six feet tall with three and a half pound brains talking about a three thousand mile high firmament. Like it's still his ways way above our ways on both yeah. models. Well, yeah. Right. I well, uh, Samuel wrote with him. He he kind of pegs the sun at about three thousand miles. And if the sun's inside the firmament, like we are in a room right now, then the the top of the firmament has to be quite a bit above that. I mean, probably at a minimum of ten thousand miles. Uh, but I don't think we're gonna know. I think it's uh, Jeremiah thirty one, maybe. I'm not quite sure the address. I think it's Jeremiah thirty one. That you know, he says, if you can measure the heights of the heavens and if you can measure the depths of the earth, then I'm gonna throw off Israel. Well, the, the point is we can't do that. We've only drilled down eight miles, and yet every textbook claims to know every single layer of the earth right down to the core. <laughs> yeah. And Rob, the right. background radiation, they've seen the farthest edges of the universe from the Big Bang. So yeah. science, science falsely so-called, has declared the edges of the heavens and the depths of the earth in violation of Jeremiah, where he says, you're not going to be able to do that, because if you do, I'm going to throw off Israel and all the promises that I have for Israel. Right. And if you notice, everything that they said depended on space, yet they didn't spend one sentence proving space existed. They yeah, never showed true. anything in scripture that showed that space existed, yet everything they did depended on it. Right. So that, that made no sense to me. Yeah. Right, one thing yeah. I thought was interesting, I actually pulled this from the video. I didn't realize this before. It talked about how the sun and moon are made for lights on Earth. It's for Earth light. Not yeah. to illuminate the soul lure system. It's to light, <laughs> it's to light up Earth. <laughs> so, yeah. I actually had something interesting happen the other night, guys. Jupiter and Saturn were both in between sun and the moon. And the side that the sun was on was illuminating Jupiter golden and Saturn golden. And the side that the moon was on had a Jupiter that was silver and a Saturn that had like a whitish, silverish glow. Dude, it was blowing my mind, guys. Just I don't know if you've ever heard about it or, or looked into it, but no, it was like never seen it, was, it was like planets were reflecting moonlight, dude. Wow. Moonlight. Just wow. check it out. It's on my YouTube channel. I've never heard of it. No one ever presented it to me. I thought it was interesting. I'm not okay. saying that's what's happening. I'm just saying based on what I saw, and I presented it to the moderators in the group too, they're like, wow, Nate, that's really, really interesting. So just interesting. I would like to see that. Yeah, yeah me yeah. too. Yeah, I can grab the video and throw it in the chat real quick, guys. You know, the, these planets or whatever we, you know, we call them planets, which mean wandering stars, which, and right. actually, if you look at the word planeo, planetes, it means uh, deceptive. Uh, it means deception. It means, you know, to, 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 to veer from truth. Um, are close. Um, I remember there was a, I think it was an ABC News affiliate that was shooting something uh, from, I think it was from a helicopter, uh, you know, just kind of your standard. ENG news camera and they they zoomed in on Saturn and like you could see it ball with rings like mm -hmm. with a news camera but you people can look it up on on YouTube it, it was it's a while back it's been quite some time now but they were like and they were commenting on it like wow you know look up look at Saturn and you're like what <laughs> <laughs> What's interesting about Saturn, guys, if you do go watch they my video, the, the ring, the rings are completely illuminated on Saturn, and they're allegedly dust and ice and rocks. Yeah, and it's like right. brilliantly, brilliantly luminary, luminous rings, and they're just dust and ice and rocks. And it's like uh, it wouldn't be that brilliant of a color if it was just reflecting sunlight. Mm -hmm. Is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, and speaking of, you know, that kind of I, a, I, I, like that. I don't have a problem with satellites. I don't know about you guys, but, 
you know, between, you know, all the stuff we've seen with balloon launched satellites or even, you know, I, I believe there's an ether up there and mm-hmm. that, there, that there is a, a, a difference in the density and buoyancy and all that when you, when the higher up you go and that, w- so whatever is keeping the sun, moon and stars afloat, oh, if you will, yeah. up there, I have no problem believing we could probably throw some equipment up there and, you know, ride the wave of the ether the same way the sun, moon, and stars are doing it. So I personally don't have a problem with satellites, whether they're going up there in a, in a circle, just riding the wave of the ether the same way the sun, moon, and stars are, or hanging up there by balloons. But I personally don't have a problem with satellites. You know, some people want to deny it and say that they don't exist. Look, I, I installed satellite dishes and I know I was pointing at something. We had a device that would tell us, you know, where, mm-hmm whatever network was that we were installing for, you know, you had to point at specific places. So I know that I was pointing at something that I could see in my device. And if I didn't point at it, they didn't get TV reception. So, you know, I don't believe it, you know, it's just, I don't believe it's just reflectivity. Some people want to say that they're bouncing signals off the firmament, which I do believe you probably can do. Mm -hmm. Um, But I don't believe that that's what was happening with the satellite dishes. So I personally don't have a problem believing that there could be equipment up there that is satellites, whether, you know, riding the wave of the ether or, you know, on balloons. I didn't believe that for a while, but that guy, uh, uh, Planantes, uh, Planantes uh, Veritas, uh, Veritas, Robert Bersano, mm-hmm. he may, he, he did something. I heard him in a conversation with an engineer named uh, Dollar, a Dollar or something like that, some world renowned engineer that's supposed to be really, really smart. He talked about the sun. He said, well, nobody knows what the sun is. It's just the conductor and and this and that. Well, he did mention something about the satellite because first I didn't believe a satellite. I said, it's lies. I don't believe it. But after what you saying, Rob, I kind of agree with him when I saw uh, when he was in conversation with another gentleman talking about how uh, they used equipment, uh, some kind of gondola or something. But during the day, when it gets near the sun, it rises up and then it goes down. It has something to do with helium. But they said something, that, well, the, uh, what do you call it? The ISS has reflectors where they can use that light and it kind of keeps them up. And then he said that it's recorded that they found that the ISS has dropped down and then it goes back up, you know? So I, I don't know, there may be some truth to that. It's right in the ether. Yeah, it may be some truth to that. When, when I, I Rob know talks about, I know there's, there's some uh, mountain folk in Peru that will argue with you that satellites are up there uh, just, you know, in space. But how the, fast is it going? Is it really going 17,500 miles an hour? <laughs> that, see, no. see on, the, on the flip side of the coin, I, I question those flimsy things and then start thinking about the movie Gravity. That fake movie Gravity, you know, there's woo, it's going and things is flimsy looking. You know, it's got to be some kind of chaos up there. I don't know. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I don't know. Yeah, but they made it look easy. I mean, I don't have a problem with when when you put um, ether into the equation. I do not have a problem with some type of machines floating around there because it would have to have a medium in order to be buoyant that high. And science completely destroys the reality of ether so but when you put that back into the equation yeah it starts to make sense right right mm-hmm. nathan you're gonna you kept trying to say something about touch riding the so, wave yeah it was so groovy when you talk about riding the wave of the ether bro just want to oh, say that. <laughs> chad on that note on that note they said at the beginning of the video flat earthers don't have a model and then they start telling everyone how high we think the sun is and trying to debunk our model yeah. based off those numbers. It's like you just said at the beginning, we don't have a model and we don't all agree on everything. But then they're saying, oh, well, flat earthers say the sun is this high and they say this and they say that and make all these declarations, empty declarations. Like uh, that's not an official number that we all put out or anything. And what's interesting is like, yeah, we don't all believe the same thing because we're not all in a cult. They're losing they're numbers. <laughs> they're, no. they're losing you know numbers. Mean? They're losing numbers. They express their concern on how many Christians yep. are becoming flat earthers. That was the one interesting thing I got from it that they were recognizing this is a major, major issue. They are seeing yep. numbers drop or whatever. They're going into damage control, but they recognize that so many people are now taking the literal interpretation of the Bible 
and they're not buying the lies, especially when they're saying it's all allegory and poetic. So I thought that was intriguing that they were even recognizing this is a major, major threat to them. But also, what are we going to do about this? Because so many Christians are believing in this crazy flat earth thing. And yet they won't even properly address it, um, you know, quite honestly, when it comes to the context of what they're trying to do in their documentary. I mean, a biblical anti-flat earth documentary for two hours and they spend like 20 minutes on on scripture and the scripture was absolutely horrible i mean okay rakia sure fine give you a little bit of a pass here even though they butchered that but going into all those nonsense verses i mean we could do a whole show we could do a whole show on all those crazy verses they use to support the fact that of course that's allegory we would agree we would agree. We're not saying to take the entire Bible literal, but what we're talking about is creation. And yes, we should take creation very literal. Let's start there before you start moving the side posts. They always love doing that, right? Oh, what about that? Is that literal? No. So therefore you can't take the Bible literal. Wait a minute. You can't even use your verse to support your globe anymore then. Well, yeah, here's, the other thing. here's the one they brought up about the moon. And let me go back to Genesis. Rob, you might be able to help this or Chris, one of you guys might be able to help on this. Somebody can help on this. <clears throat> But when it says when it says that the, it says that it calls the moon the lesser light, they try to argue on the basis of the day four account that the moon has got its own light. And I read a day four account in Genesis one. It doesn't say it has its own light. It says it's a light. And then they say, well, that means that it must have its own light. I don't see where you get that. I brought a, a moon. reflector, a moon. Nice. Yeah. And pretend this is the moon. It's reflecting. Now I'm gonna. Trying to aim this just right. Whoa! Wow! Wow! Isn't that bright? This was a brilliant idea. Yeah. <laughs> Is this reflector generating light? Yeah. Uh, well, it's bouncing off of it. It's reflecting the sun's light. It wow. is. I'm going to do a screen share here, showing that scripture uh, in Genesis chapter one, verse sixteen. And God made two, two great lights. Yes. He didn't say he made one great light and a reflective rock. <laughs> That's right. Right. And they keep going, Rob, because it says, it it says, says the it one says, is the lesser light. It says later in the Bible, too, that the moon will cease to give it her, her light. Give. That it right. will cease giving it. Well, I kept, I kept noticing they would say some objection that's pretty ludicrous from our perspective, and then they would attack that, like, Oh, flat earthers, they believe the earth or the sun is a disc. I think it was Faulkner mentioned that or something like that. And I'm like, well, I, have, I haven't heard that said before. I'm sure some people do, but it's not like all of us say, yes, the sun is some disc in the sky or mm. or they, oh, flat earthers believe this or they believe. And then they just attack this one little idiotic notion, you know, or, mm. or a little side. Of and it's like, so then anybody coming along with the newbie goes oh okay i guess that's a dumb thing chad, chad yeah. what do you expect they didn't interview any biblical flat earthers yeah no. right yeah. Of course yeah. not. right of course not. uh you know they're talking about you know scientists use gravity we know gravity we know it works blah 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 i was thinking about it the difference between a flat earth and a round earth i mean wouldn't the physics be totally different i would think so i mean like gravity momentum all of those have laws that obey every time we use them so you'd think they might be different in a flat Earth. Hundreds of thousands of scientists have used gravity to explain the world around us. It's one of the most foundational forces known and is the basis for all of physics. What is gravity? You have no idea. Okay, next question. <laughs> Wow. No, here's the difference. We can describe gravity. Okay. We can say what it does to other things. We can, we can measure it, predict with it. But when you start asking like what it is, I, I, I don't know. We look out in the universe and 85% of all the gravity that's out there has some mysterious unknown source. We add up all the stars, the galaxies, the planets, the comets, the black holes, the dark clouds, everything out there that we can see, touch, smell, or taste. And it doesn't add up to give us the gravity that we see operating in this universe. So really we should be calling it the dark force. Because we don't know if it's made of matter. Like, it could be a profound misnomer, sending people off in thought directions that might not really be uh, the right path. So dark matter is just simply what we call this thing about which we know nothing, responsible for 85% of the gravity of the cosmos. It is the longest standing unsolved problem in modern astrophysics. Dark matter, dark energy. Everything we know about the universe what we're made of, galaxies, stars, planets, that's all right here. So, according to this chart, we are 96% stupid.
I'm like, yeah, the math that you're using for gravity, your end result was some of your self-professed most brilliant people in the world saying when it comes to the cosmology, the, the, it doesn't add up to the gravity that we should see. So we are 96% stupid when it comes to our understanding of the cosmos. And Mitsuko Kaku going, you know, when it comes to cosmology, we're off by a factor of 10 to the 120th power. This is the largest mismatch between science and you know, observation, whatever he says. But yeah. I mean, so their math that they're so proud of led them to being 96% stupid and off by 10 to 120th. <laughs> and, and the thing is, God always calls us just to believe in truth. Amen. The shape of the earth is not unknowable. It exists in the present. And for that reason, all we have to do is observe it directly. And who better to talk about the shape of the earth than a Christian man who has seen it with his own eyes? General Charlie Duke was the Capcom that was the voice of Houston during the Apollo 11 moon landing, and also went to the moon himself on Apollo 16. General Duke, you're one of the only few men alive right now that's been an eyewitness to all this. Can you tell us what you observed? In your mind, when you look at it from space, from 20,000 miles, you see the curvature of the Earth, not only on the sides, but on the top and the bottom. It's obvious a sphere. And the moon too, the moon is a sphere, it's not flat. It's obvious that the earth, as I viewed it with my eyes and 23 other people on Apollo viewed it, it was a sphere. Why would people who are, who are proclaiming to want to stand on the, 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 uh, this thing called truth, why wouldn't they bring up the fact that NASA actually admitted that they lost all of the data and information to get to the moon and we can't go back because it would be too painful and too expensive to do such a thing. It was all recorded on these telemetry tapes. So where is this hard evidence? I haven't uh, seen anything that indicates the telemetry data is even in existence. And as I said, even if we had it, we don't have the machines to play it back. But your, you, your own research has shown the telemetry data is missing. That's, that's right. Could this be true? Mankind's first interplanetary exploration and the original science data is missing? If it's anywhere, it should be here at NASA's Goddard Space Center in Maryland, home to the National Space Science Data Archives. This film you're making now, what is it? Uh, does it have a name? I mean, do you have you have a name for it yet, or are you? Call it Did we go? Did we go? Okay, okay. Doesn't have it either. The Smithsonian right. doesn't have it. Right. Johnson doesn't right. have it. Right. Right. We we've been unable to 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 track it down. I mean, we don't know uh, where this this telemetry data ended up, and we don't know the what what path it may have taken. So. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm afraid I can't really give you much of a clue as to as to where this data ended up and whether it, it still exists or NASA not. NASA admitted that it had lost lost the original footage of man's first steps on the moon. My next guest, Aaron Raynan, started out believing the official version of history. Tell us uh, why you have changed your mind and now become a skeptic. I was the first to report, and you played the clip earlier tonight, that all the science data, the telemetry data, was missing. Now. Geraldo, for NASA to come out and say that all the tapes were erased, I mean, you must, it's incredible. Geraldo, this isn't just one tape. This is rooms of tape labeled Apollo 11 moon landing. Someone had to physically go and erase it. And it just, you know, I really, in my heart, Geraldo, I want us to go. And I know all your viewers want us to go. We're also joined in L.A. by Bill Nye, the science guy. Bill, Aaron's right about erasing these tapes. I mean... No, okay, it's my turn, kids. Okay. So uh, uh, what happened, these were NASA tapes, and I got lost. Stuff happens. Okay. I, I, you know, it's very challenging to try to prove we landed on the moon, and it shouldn't be challenging. The tapes should be there. There should be plenty of evidence. I go to the moon in a nanosecond. Uh, the problem is we don't have the technology to do that anymore. We used to, but we... Uh, destroyed that technology and it's a painful process to build it back again. Once we, once we travel beyond low Earth orbit, the crew will be exposed to larger amounts of radiation. So we have to design both the crew protection systems and our electronic systems to withstand this radiation. If there is something that definitely, at least in my opinion, 
uh, exposes the Apollo program as a fraud. It's the Orion Project. The Orion Project, uh, after they retired the space shuttle, the next project that's on the board right now is called Project Orion. And um, they're pretty much telling you that Apollo never happened, especially when they put out videos like this talking about the Van Allen radiation belts. We are headed 3,600 miles above Earth, 15 times higher from the planet than the International Space Station. As we get further away from Earth, we'll pass through the Van Allen belts, an area of dangerous radiation. What? As we get further away from Earth, we'll pass through the Van Allen belts, an area of dangerous radiation. One more time. An area of dangerous radiation. Oh. What's wrong with that radiation? Radiation like this could harm the guidance systems, onboard computers, or other electronics on Orion. Naturally, we have to pass through this danger zone twice, once up and once back. That doesn't sound good. Naturally, we have to pass through this danger zone twice, once up and once back. But Orion has protection. Shielding will be put to the test as the vehicle cuts through the waves of radiation. Sensors aboard will record radiation levels for scientists to study. We must solve these challenges before we send people through this region of space. What? We must solve these challenges before we send people through this region of space? I thought this problem was solved over 40 years ago when he sent a bunch of people in jumpsuits and tin cans through it there and back a half dozen times. Oh, oh, but I forgot. The, uh, the Apollo guys, the, they were clueless uh, regarding the radiation belt. Uh, that, it didn't affect them. I don't know the distance to the Van Allen radiation belt. And if we did, it wasn't a problem. We, if we were going to encounter it, then we would have had to build the spacecraft and the spacesuit to, uh, to, to not give humans a problem. You, you don't just build something and hope it works. You study to see what uh, the threats are, the environment is, and then you say, how thick do I have to make the metal on the spacecraft so that going through this kind of radiation or these kind of meteoroids, it won't get hurt. And so and then we build it that way. I help manage the Orion Crew and Service Module Office. Um, we're responsible for developing the crew capsule, which is where the crew lives and works when they're in space, um, and the service module, which is what provides the, the power and the fuel um, and the consumables then that is plumbed over to uh, the crew module. Uh, we don't have the ultimate answer for radiation on Orion. We're still working on that. Um, you know, if we were to build Orion out of the materials we need and the sole job was to protect for the radiation environment, the vehicle would really be too heavy. So we have to balance the weight of the materials that we put on the spacecraft um, with how much protection it's providing the crew. So we're really looking at it from an operational perspective. If we um, understand a radiation event has happened, the crew will actually take shelter in the aft bay of the vehicle. Uh, we have found over the years that uh, water is a really great radiation absorbing material. Um, so we could do things like uh, water that's already there in the water bags for drinking and things like that, that, that water could be used to shield them. Uh, as well as we've had some concepts like a, a water field vest that they could put on should they, um, to, should they know there's an event and need to be protected. We don't have a, um, a clue when it comes to like how to protect them from like radiation. So we're gonna just like put them up there in like a water suits. Yeah, we like water suits and and like if they, we put water all around them, you know, so the radiation could go like into the water and then you know they could drink it and it could be like a fantastic four. Everybody comes, be, be, they come back and be mutants when they get back. But but we we just got some ideas, you know. Yeah. But don't worry about it. Uh, yeah, I know there are refugees everywhere and like people are starving and stuff and like we have homeless all over the place. But if we spend like a few trillion dollars, um, I think we should be able to figure out how to make um, water suits for the astronauts in space. And um, then maybe it'll work out like it did for the guys in Apollo. The belts are 1,000 miles to 
25,000 miles above then, the Earth. We, then we went right out through them. No effects on your cells. Mm -mm, didn't even know it. I don't think anybody, well, maybe somebody said you went through the radiation belt, but we didn't feel it inside and we didn't get any, you know, added radiation. Yeah, if you pretend that it's not really there, then you can, you can just go right through it. To protect the astronauts from the Van Allen radiation belts, the lunar module would have required six feet of lead shielding. But here's what they really had for protection. Obviously, the only shielding they had was the literally paper-thin outer hull of aluminum and their suits consisting of glass fiber, some aluminum fibers, and silicon rubber. It's very interesting concerning radiation that the astronauts were protected by a thin film of aluminum when here on Earth they put a lead shield on us when they take a dental x-ray. In conclusion, when NASA themselves admit to never having left low Earth orbit, and the fact that we don't even have the materials that could withstand the extreme temperatures and cosmic rays in space, how on Earth can anyone believe that we ever went to the moon? <laughs> You know what they said? Their argument was... And why did they not share that in the documentary? Yeah, their right. Argument, their argument in the documentary was that they didn't have the technology to fake it back then, but had the technology to go. And now we have the technology to fake it, but don't have the technology to go. <laughs> so Kyle, we hear all the time that they actually faked the broadcast of going to the moon. And I've heard that it's really easy to fake maybe the uh, 20 seconds that you see on YouTube nowadays using modern technology. <laughs> But you've been in media, you've been yeah. doing video and film for 30 years. Yeah. Yeah. What would it take to fake a yeah. continual live broadcast for hours of the moon uh, mission? Yeah, I mean, we see like science fiction movies now and they're like, you know, creating these amazing environments. But this is the late 1960s. And the simple answer is they just didn't have the technology back then to fake it. That's like, hilarious. I, mean, I was thinking the exact same thing. I'm like, wait a minute. We had the technology to allegedly go to the freaking moon, but we didn't have the ability to do special effects. <laughs> <laughs> it's so insane. It's the most ridiculous part. Oh, and, then he said, oh, and then he said, talked about moon rocks. You can't talk about moon rocks. They tested those and they came out to be petrified wood. <laughs> wood yeah, right. they, gave, they gave to the Swedes. Yeah. Yep. And the guy, but right now, walking on Earth, Five people allegedly have been to the moon. Now the numbers should be growing as far as people that have walked on the moon, not getting smaller, right? <laughs> but these arguments over little details forget the bigger picture, that there were a total of nine Apollo missions to the moon, which included six actual manned landings. The evidence is overwhelming that we landed on the moon six times. If we faked it, why did we fake it nine times? If you're going to fake something, do it once and shut up. What's funny is the guy tried to use the argument. He tried to use the argument. Oh, if we were going to fake it, we would just go one time. We wouldn't go nine times. Well, you haven't done it in 50 years. So you did, just, you did just fake it one time. That's it. You faked it 50 years ago and you did it a couple times, but it was one big fakery. I'm and still waiting for the. I'm still waiting for the uh, women to rush NASA's gates and demand the first woman to walk on the moon. Right? I love using that, especially when I'm talking to women because they get so mad. They're like, "Man, they're sexist, man. They won't even let a woman." But guys, guys, you guys are all talking about 60s technology. They could, they could talk to someone in the White House. I mean, that was good technology back then. Why, why are you With guys doing no it? lag whatsoever? Yeah, no I mean, lag. come on, <laughs> a phone call think, to the I White House. Should... They've what actually was... been exposed as traitors to humanity. Is what they really are. Yeah, and those astronauts back in the late sixties, they they said they were Christians, so they wouldn't be lying. They were Christian. Right. Yeah. Guys, they read, right. they read Genesis. They read Genesis. I mean, that makes a lot of sense from the yeah. origins of you know Werner von Braun and Jack Parsons to read Scripture. I mean, that makes a ton of sense, right? Me, let's read Scripture when we're up there, and let's just solidify that ball for all the Christians. I mean, there's no more debate. When they read Genesis, uh, they're going to see the ball. They, well, you got to do it on Christmas. So, you know, yeah, when, you're, yeah. when you're playing the part of Apollo, you have yes. to honor the sun god by right. recognizing the sun god's birthday on December 25th. What, what, what then, was then, that? Then, you, then you turn around and say, okay, I'm leaving NASA and I'm going to join a creation <laughs> ministry. That's a good, that's a good move, actually. You know, 
you know, it, Paul talks about, you know, don't don't marvel because Satan himself appears as an angel of light. So it should be no wonder that his right. ministers would do the same thing. So the best place for somebody to do that, to do their work, if you're into the evil, would be in the church. What better way to, right. to see people would be to set up a shop in the church? Now, I don't know these people's hearts, so I'm not judging them. I'm just saying it's very likely that that could happen, especially if you're going to call yourself a Christian that was an astronaut. You say you were an astronaut. You say you went to the moon. Uh, Jim Irwin, right? Who signed who signed a picture of himself allegedly on the moon to me? Aim for your dreams, Rob. Reach high. Signed high. You know, Jim Irwin came to my church. He was part of a creation ministry. He spent supposedly most of his life after NASA trying to find Noah's Ark. Wow, great Christian guy, right? Well, he's the guy that brought back the Genesis rock that just so happens to refute Genesis. Wow. <laughs> Yeah. What 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 yeah, fantasy just, what uh, fantasy world though what fantasy world are they living in when they're just like thinking for some reason in these creation ministries the world doesn't look them as foolish because one of their big arguments is fe like flat earth makes Christians look foolish or look stupid the fact is people are already laughing at the creation ministries from a world you know from a world standpoint they already think it's uh, ridiculous they have no prestige whatsoever and they're trying to get this veneer of like oh you know we don't want to look stupid you already do look stupid. Newsflash, Croatian <laughs> ministries, you're laughed at by the whole world. They think it's ridiculous right. about the Ark encounter. You know, they've done they've done phenomenal work. I don't want to bash them completely because they have done phenomenal work exposing the lies of evolution. But let's get rid of this notion thinking that they have some sort of prestige and they're looked at as very intellectual because the world laughs at the Croatian ministries. Why is it that they're so worried about, oh, we don't want Christians to be made to look stupid? I find they say it all the time. Every time I've seen them come forward, they always say, Flat Earth was created to make Christians look stupid. Prove it. Prove it. Show me no. through history how that's true, that this was the devise, the conspiracy. It's one thing to say anything, but they cannot prove it, and they use it all the time. But you know what? You're in a creation ministry. You know, Bill Nye it walked in with, uh, you know, uh, what's his name there? Answers in Genesis, Ken Ham. Right. And he yeah. said, oh, look at our scientists. Are you impressed? And, and Bill Nye was like, no, I think you guys are ridiculous. And he was snide about it, too. I mean, he was he totally was. arrogant and insulting the man, Ken Ham, in his own house. Sure. Now, the interesting but, part is when you look at that video, the teenagers that are that are surrounding them, they're looking at Ken Ham and they're looking at Bill Nye and they're getting upset. You can see they're actually getting angry, but they're looking at Ken Ham. You need to put this guy down. And Ken Ham was basically kissing his feet. OK, it was embarrassing. It was. So, and he also basically went so far to say that we were we came from Martians. And and Cam was like, isn't that kind of crazy? It's like, no, no, it's very believable. But he was sitting with all those children, telling right. them. And again, you know, you guys came from Martians, you know. And even even Ken Ham said, oh, oh, Bill, Bill, I'd love to hear this. I'd love to hear you prove it. And Bill Bill Nye's like, well, we can't prove it. Sorry. But one thing that I wanted to go back to real quick was that. Um, about the about the pictures and how they debunked the pictures about being you know um, the the fakery of of the NAF, NASA photos in the documentary where you know they talked about oh. you know of course these things are composites and you know all these things this is how they 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 played it and they can't get real images of the Earth or whole images of the Earth because we don't go that high anymore so critical thinking would say okay well. We can't get a picture because we don't go 240,000 miles up. Right. Then how are we putting rovers on Mars, which is <laughs> yep. 34 million miles away? Right. <laughs> right. So why aren't we getting pictures of the Earth every time we, we put a rover on Mars? Yep. Well, some right. critical we thinking would make you say. Some, yep. some would say we did. Well, like, uh, the, and, and this was the one that, one of the things that, started me changing my beliefs was the the galileo space probe that was on its way to jupiter supposedly in 1990 turned around and shot the image of the earth you know and that was the time lapse of a 25 hour rotation of the earth allegedly uh shot in 1990 but none of the clouds are moving you know so you know, i'm looking at that going wait a minute <laughs> 25 yeah. hours none of the clouds are moving <laughs> One of the first images that I saw when I did my initial research was from this web page right here, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory website. And this shows a video right here. And you click on that to open it.
and this is what you get. And this is a very small and low res video. Uh, and when you look at it, you're like, wow. Okay, this is supposedly the Galileo space probe at 6 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on December 11th, 1990, when the spacecraft was about 1.3 million miles away from the planet. This is a time lapse representing about 25 hours of rotation. So just over a day. See, it says motion picture showing a 25 hour period of Earth's rotation and atmospheric dynamics. I'm not really seeing any atmospheric dynamics. I see what appears to be a blue marble with clouds on it, but I don't perceive any motion in the clouds. And that's the first thing that caught my attention in the beginning of my journey was like, wait a minute, none of the clouds are moving. I could take my camera outside and point it at the sky for an hour and speed it up, you know, later. And the clouds are going to be doing all kinds of stuff. But on December 11th, 1990, in 25 hours, it doesn't appear the clouds are doing anything. Now I had to hunt around for a larger version of this, a better higher resolution version of this. I don't remember where I found it, but I did eventually find a, uh, a bigger video, higher resolution. And this is that video right here. So you can see it's uh, HD, uh, much crisper. I actually added a little bit of sharpening to it to uh, make everything stand out even more. And um, so we'll look at it again. And so one of my questions is, were they even capable of producing an image like this and beaming it back to Earth from 1.3 million miles away back in 1990? That I, maybe so, I don't know, but seems suspicious to me. But again, none of the clouds appear to be moving. You know, if you pick, pick a region to look at and, uh, you know, I don't see the clouds changing at all. They seem to be, just be following the ball as it rotates. So that's what initially got me questioning everything. And the other thing is, if this is a space probe flying away from the Earth, how is that working in this scenario right here? where we're supposedly in a solar system with the sun racing through the universe at uh, over a half a million miles per hour, how is the space probe keeping up? You might say gravity is uh, taking the space probe along for the ride, but I'm having a hard time with that. I don't really buy that argument. You know, it's okay if you do, but I just, I, I have a hard time believing that if the solar system is whipping through the galaxy at over a half a million miles per hour, how the heck is the Galileo space probe keeping up with everything and keeping a nice steady shot of the earth? That just doesn't make any sense to me. Now here is some footage allegedly shot from a Japanese space probe. Now this moon might looks somewhat realistic, I suppose. Um, wondering where the stars are. And here comes the Earth popping up here. Again, this does not look realistic to me. I'm sorry, there should be lots of stars out here. This isn't giving the appearance to me of an exposure issue where they always say, well, the, the camera is cranked down, so the exposure, you know, say, well, actually, there's probably a way I can check that. I can adjust the brightness. And the contrast, I mean, if this is HD and it claims to be HD, it supposedly is HD footage. And when I adjust the brightness, nah, there's no, there's no information on this video. There's no data in here. I should be able to see the Milky Way galaxy back there. I'm adjusting this. There's no information. That is a pitch black background. There's nothing here indicating that this is HD footage of the Earth in space. It should look more like this. So I'm going to call BS on this. Also, this is total CGI in my opinion. Now, look at this animation right here. And I'm going to call it an animation because that's what I believe it is. This is from 2011. This is supposedly a 4K video. Uh, taken by the Electro L weather satellite. Notice anything different? Now, along the same lines, how is this geostationary satellite keeping a perfectly stable shot of the Earth at about a million miles away, enduring all the radiation that's out there, uh, while the solar system is allegedly shooting through space at over 500,000 miles per hour? 
how is this keeping a perfectly stable shot of the earth? Uh, I don't know, but looking at them both side by side, both represent a day. Notice anything different? But the only thing I'm noticing is better CGI. This is the re this represents over 20 years of advancement in CGI technology. And then we come to this one right here. This is from August 5th, 2015. From a million miles away, NASA camera shows moon crossing face of the Earth. This is, I guess, the epic camera or something like that. Discover satellite. So I downloaded that video. And I have it here in my video software. And I call this the Bozo Earth because that's exactly what it looks like, like some kind of Bozo clown, especially like freeze frame right here. So you got like an eyeball here with a long eyebrow, Bozo nose, and sad frown face. There's a lot wrong with this picture. Uh, I know a lot of people have covered this in the past. But what you can see right here is the edge of the camera lens, I guess. So it's sort of like got what I would imagine something around the equivalent of a looking through a toilet paper tube or something as far as field of view goes. Um, again, there's no cloud movement. There's no per perception of any clouds moving here. I don't see any movement in any clouds. They're just rotating with the earth. I don't see clouds changing shape. Now this is the this is a CGI representation of the satellite, as they always are, CGI. We never actually see a satellite, we just see artist renditions of the satellite staring at the Earth. Now, this is a million miles away in what they call, I think it's Lagrange or something like that, L1. How the heck is this satellite sitting there, stationary, looking through a toilet paper tube, looking at the Earth, keeping it perfectly in the frame with the solar system doing this? Again, I don't get that. How is that happening? How is this thing compensating for all of the motion that is supposedly taking place with our solar system trailing along the sun in a vortex through the Milky Way galaxy. How does that make sense to anybody? Second of all, we're told that there's this thing out there called the Van Allen radiation belt. And that supposedly protects the earth from harmful radiation blasts coming from the sun. You see pictures like this, solar wind, bow shock wave, Van Allen radiation belt. So, you know, we supposedly have this blast of solar wind radiation slamming into the earth, causing some kind of configuration like this in terms of how all that wraps around the earth as the earth is supposedly protected by the Van Allen radiation belts that go out to 25,000 miles. So this satellite is right in the middle of the blast wave where it, it has to be unimaginably hot, for one thing, blasted by radiation. Well, last time I checked, radiation wreaks havoc with computers and pretty much anything. <laughs> so how is this satellite just sitting there in all that solar wind as the sun's moving through the galaxy at over a half a million miles per hour in this vortex path, looking through a toilet paper tube field of view, and keeping a nice, clean, steady shot of the Earth like this. I don't know how that's possible, but here we have the Earth again with no clouds moving, and here we have a moon popping in, photobombing us. Now, this moon would be, you know, a lot closer to the satellite, and it should be way brighter. Th this camera should register some, if it has any kind of an iris in it, unless it's just a fixed iris, uh, well, if it's a fixed iris, the iris, then this thing should be blown out. This this should be very bright. It should be a lot brighter. It should probably look something like this. And if it has an iris, it should adjust. There should be some kind of dimming of the Earth behind it uh, if, to keep this this kind of exposure. So I don't see any evidence of what should happen with a camera. 
when something brighter comes into the frame in the foreground. The other problem is when you look at this moon, it has some very bizarre shadowing on this one side right here. And when you zoom in on it, it's got uh, like a green edge, like it's like a mask or something. Uh, and there's no three dimensionality to this. It looks like it's just a something moving across the screen that that is two dimensional. See the shadow on the right side? It never changes going all the way across. You would think that due to the angles, if it's a 3D object and this is an actual representation, and this is an actual photograph of the moon going by, then the lighting should change, the exposure should change, the shadows should change, but none of that changes because we've been punked by a bozo. So now let's compare the Galileo 1990 with the 2011 space probe on the right, the complete CGI in the bottom left, and the 2015 Bozo Earth. The top left and the bottom right, none of the clouds appear to be moving in any way, shape, or form. Of course, the CGI shows the clouds moving on the lower left, and what I'm going to say is CGI allegedly from a 2015, from a 2011 space probe, the clouds are moving. So what's the deal? Why can't they get it right? Well, because we're dealing with different time periods and we're dealing with different levels of sophistication in CGI technology. And so this, among many, many other observations, analyzing video footage and uh, still imagery from NASA, JPL, and other websites, it just doesn't add up. It, there's too many things wrong with it, too many strange anomalies, too many inconsistencies, clouds moving sometimes, clouds not moving other times never seeing any stars. It, this is something that this has been a pet peeve of mine is like, where are the stars? Mm -hmm. And people keep trying to tell me, well, you're an idiot. You know, it's the exposure of the camera. I'm like, look, I work with cameras. Right. right. Like, and I can, I'm going to post this one of these as I keep, you know, I've, I've kind of, I'm trying to get back on seed, but I got like a hundred videos that are in various sure. stages of completion that I probably never get released. But um, I went outside, there's a street lamp right outside my house. And um, I went outside at night. It was one of those nights where I think it was probably Jupiter is off to the side of the moon. So you have a bright shining moon, a bright street lamp. And I used the, uh, the, the, the flash on my iPhone and took a picture of my hand. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I got my hand brightly illuminated by this with the street lamp and the moon, and I can still see it. <laughs> oh, man. So, wow. And anybody could do this. Anybody could go out and do this. It's going to debunk right away. <laughs> nonsense. It's like if my freaking iPhone can pick up Jupiter with the flashlight shining on my hand and the street light and the moon, what's wrong with NASA? Right. Put an iPhone out there for context. We <laughs> <laughs> got it. My, my laptop's down to two percent. I really appreciate you having me on, Chris, and everything. I'll see you guys all in Ohio. Hey, hey, see you, bro. See you, Nate. Hey, man. See you, man. Yeah, the, in the documentary, they won't even touch this stuff, and that—that's what is this completely dishonesty, or is it? They've claimed they've looked into these things. And yet they are just either being completely dishonest or, again, operating in complete ignorance. And that would be the challenge. If you guys are watching, answer the, those, that question. I think, you know, I've asked you guys that twice. You know, same with the moon landing. I mean, that was such a farce of, of debunking moon landing in three minutes with a, with a, with a uh, you know, an astronaut. Um, and so is that absolutely amazing. Um, you know, if you guys watched the documentary, uh, that was probably one of the the most cringeworthy moments of how they debunked the moon landing. You know, these guys would make statements in that documentary like, there's no way this could happen. I'm like, what are you talking about? There's no way. There's been lots of videos. I mean, I've produced a bunch of them. A whole lot of other people have made videos showing most of the arguments that, that they are saying is we have an answer for them. We've gone out and done tech. We've proven things that there, there are ways that these things happen. So they're making these broad stroke statements. There's no way that could happen on a flat earth. Well, yeah, there is like, you know, the sun setting and stuff. I'm not gonna play it here just for the sake of time, but this video people can look up for themselves. This was one on my channel, atmospheric magnification slash refraction and the movement of the sun over the earth is a four minute video talks about atmospheric refraction and how you can get a sunset 
you know, with a with a sun moving parallel to the surface of the Earth, no problem. Um, this video right here, 26 minutes long, flat Earth and atmospheric magnification. That's the short version, 26 minutes. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of other ones in, in my playlist. I got a playlist called Rob's Flat Earth Videos. Um, you can there's 108 videos in there, but you can go through and and see some of the experiments that that I did, and based on mainstream science logic. You got mainstream science guys like the guys that tried to, to try to explain why the Chicago skyline could be seen. And an optics professor at a university said, well, the atmosphere acts like a magnifying glass. You know, oh, really yeah. Like a <laughs> yeah. You know, and you can look up atmospheric refraction and stuff like that, even on like on Wikipedia. And it will tell you that it acts like a magnifying glass. Well, that just oh, makes yeah. sense because the atmosphere is, is full of an insane amount of moisture. I mean, there's so much, you know, especially in the summertime, obviously there's more because of humidity, but just in general, there's a lot of moisture in the air. What is moisture? Well, it's microscopic drops of water. Well, spherical drops of water, put, it, put them all together, and you got a big convex lens. What's a convex lens? It's a magnifying glass. Right. So I'm taking their science and applied it with some a little test that anybody can do with about $5 worth of material you can get at Walmart. And demonstrate how the lower parts of cities can easily disappear. Um, how right the here, sun Rob. set. There you go. Right here. <laughs> yeah, you know, actually, maybe I will play. It's only four minutes long. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sure. you should. Oh, that was a good, that was a good video. I like that I one. Love that video. Yeah, same here. Yeah, let me, let me, so I went and got this, man. Oh, sorry. It's always a commercial break here first. Hey, I want to get one of those. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> um, water in our atmosphere. I went to a few websites. I just did a Google how much water is in the atmosphere, you know. And uh, this is the USGS website, usgs.gov, Science for a Changing World. The USGS Water Science School talks about there is always water in the atmosphere. Clouds are, of course, the most visible manifestation of atmospheric water. But even clean air contains water, water in particles that are too small to be seen. One estimate of the volume of water in the atmosphere at any one time is about 3,100 cubic miles per 12,900 cubic kilometers. And it goes on to say that uh, if all the water that's in the atmosphere were to rain down at once, it would cover the globe uh, to a depth of about one inch. And this is confirmed on a number of websites, but I'll just show you one more just for the sake of argument here. This is the Y Files, the science behind the news. They have an article, how much water is in the atmosphere. It says, at any moment, the atmosphere contains an astounding 37.5 million billion gallons of water in the invisible vapor phase. This is enough water to cover the entire Earth, land and ocean with one inch of rain. And of course, goes on to talk about that as well. So yeah, there's a lot of water in the atmosphere. I think we all kind of just know that, but I don't think we've ever really thought about what that means. And so uh, I'm thinking if the atmosphere, especially over water, is made up of zillions and zillions of tiny convex drops of water, then collectively, perhaps they all combine to make one big convex lens, in which case it would act like a magnifying glass. Okay, so with that in mind, let's look up some websites dealing with the refraction of light. You might see a graphic, something like this, showing light bending downward. And here's your typical graphic showing how uh, light rays entering some sort of medium, like in this case water, refraction causes the light to bend downward. Now we've all seen pictures of you know a pencil or something in a glass of water and how not only does refraction bend the image downward, it also magnifies it. I'm going to say that again. Water causes refraction bending the image downward and magnifies it. So this is important now. So now, now back to another clip from that previous video. Science is the same of that of a lens. Here's a simple example. So if you're looking at, at uh, Chicago here, just maybe you can, now you can just see the top of, uh, of the Sears Tower. And if our simulated uh, temperature inversion moves into place, hopefully now you can see all of, pretty much all of Chicago, all the lower buildings. Including, including what's at ground level. So the atmosphere really is like acting like a lens. 
podcast. So the atmosphere really is acting like a lens. You know, you heard it right from the horse's mouth, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> The atmosphere really is acting like a lens. I thought that one actually showed the sunset and stuff. But anyway, you could watch some of the other videos on there where I actually took a, a magnification sheet, one of those reader sheets you can get, and set it up and uh, put a, a cutout of a city behind it. And using on a flat surface, using the camera of my iPhone, so you can imagine that here's the phone, here's the sheet um, representing the atmosphere, and here's the city. All I did was pull the camera back, and what do you know? You lose the lower part of the city. Wow, without curvature. And then I thought, well, if it worked by moving the camera back, what if I just kept a camera stationary, kept the atmosphere lens in place, and then had a sun like on a you know, uh, a, a platform that kept the same distance above the table and moved the sun away. Well, what do you know? The sun yeah. set. And what was interesting yeah. is because I'm moving the sun further away from the magnification sh uh, sheet, it kept the same size or pretty darn close to it, you know, because it's moving away, but as it's moving away, it's being magnified. So this, the sun kept pretty close to the same size diameter uh, when it as it was when it was close when it moved away but it was the light was bending downward causing the sun to set moving across you know, a flat surface you know parallel across a flat surface so you know these people say there's no way that's like saying two plus two is the only way you can get to four <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> it's like no there's a, a lot of different ways you can get to four you know two plus two is not the only way to four Right. You've got to spend some time thinking about it and you'll realize, you know what, this was part of, you know, people wonder why, you know, otherwise presumably sane people would believe something like this and risk everything to do so. I mean, there's no benefit to becoming a flat earther. I mean, you get, you're ridiculed, you lose you know, all kinds of stuff. You know, oh, yeah. friend, family, you know, income, the credibility, you name it. There's, there's, look, save me. Save me from being a flat earther. I want to go back to when it was peaceful and people weren't. <laughs> you know, Save me. The sweet voice of ignorance, you know, please. Well, it's, it's because you start looking, first of all, scripture, there's no way. Sorry, Danny. Sorry, Dr. Boyd. It's, the Bible's a flat earth book. You can't get around it. Yeah. Um, you can lie about it, which is what you guys are doing. Right, but yeah. It's a flat earth book. And, you know, if you claim to be a Bible believing Christian, well, then you're stuck. Because mm -hmm. that's what it says. But then when you go out and start doing tests for yourself and, and you don't immediately just, you know, as soon as you you have some kind of result, say, okay, that's it. Yay. You, you got to break it down. You got to test it again. You peer review, right? I mean, that's, that's what real science is supposed to be. And, you know, if, but science is supposed to be also supposed to be testable, observable, and repeatable. And repeatable. Right. Right. Yeah, you right. should go back out there and, you know, I could tell you what I did. Well, you should be able to go out and do the same test I did and get the same results given right. the same conditions. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, yeah. um, and what we find it and the, the longer video, um, uh, this is the short version here. This one, well, this one talks about, um, this city right here uh, where I was when I took this picture, you know, I'm like, I think it was like a half a mile away. That's the Willis tower. And yet we could see that from 46 miles away. We could, we could see the Willis tower, but it looked like this. Okay. So here's my car, right. Or I'm not my car. I'm sitting in the car, taking a picture of this car in front of that, whoops, in front of that. This is like a half mile away. And yet, so I scaled the same car down to the relative size of this boat, which is about maybe a half mile away from where we were on the beach. Look at the size of the Willis Tower. Yeah. 46 miles away. Right. You know, compared to the car. Clearly, this thing is magnified, you know. Mm -hmm. We're looking across a flat plane of water, 46 miles across. Check this image out right here. Now, I caught this image shortly after Rick and I returned from our trip across the lake. Uh, we grabbed a bite to eat, and then we went out to the beach, and it was still clear out, so we got the camera out and looked 46 miles across the lake to see this right here. This image is extraordinary, okay? 
The boat right here, I'm going to guess, is less than a mile away. And I base that because these people walking in front of the camera here are walking across some rocks that sort of jut out and, and kind of fence in the uh, harbor area. And they are uh, only about a quarter of a mile away from where we were when I shot this. I shot this image from right about here. This is where we were uh, looking across, and this is the area right here where those people were walking. And the boat, as you could tell uh, by the size of the people on the boat, wasn't too much further beyond that. So maybe a half mile to a mile, or at the most, I would say, away from where we were. All right, now when I was headed back to Chicago to catch my flight, I snapped this picture of the Willis Tower. And this is, if you go on Google Earth, uh, this is right about the area right here where I believe I, I was when I took that picture. Looking across, it's only about 0.6 of a mile. So I'm just a little over a half mile away, and look at the size of the tower as compared to the car that was diagonally in front of me. We were looking at the Willis Tower from this direction right here when we were on the other side of the lake. Now, okay, so let me slide the car over and shrink it down to the appropriate scale beside the boat. Do you see something rather interesting here? This building is significantly magnified. The image on the left shows the size and scale of the building next to a car at 0.6 of a mile away. The image on the right shows the same building and the same car with a boat at 46 miles away. The atmosphere really is acting like a lens. What type of lens? A convex lens or a magnifying glass. So I'm going to suggest this is what's happening. The atmosphere is acting like a lens, which magnifies the city, brings it up a little closer, and as it does so, we start to lose a little bit of the bottom of the buildings, and perhaps due to uh, the density in the atmosphere, there's an additional refraction in, that takes place that makes it drop down even more. Is that what happened? Let's look at it from another angle here, from the side view. I'll bring our graphic back in of refraction. Let's go ahead and orient the graphic so it better represents what we're looking at here. I'll angle the light rays to show the density of the air here causing the refraction and bring our lens in so we can magnify the city. It brings the city up, brings the city up, and as it does so, we start to lose a little bit of the bottom of the city, and perhaps either due to the magnification or due to additional refraction, maybe it is dropped down a little bit more, and uh, this is what we end up with. Huh. Just like we saw. Now this is a still frame from the half hour video that I did and uh, the numbers you see there are all based on the numbers that Tony was giving me based on his device. Uh, his device said it was 37 nautical miles which is 42.6 statute miles but when you plot the same exact location that we were at the exact distance you get on Google Earth is uh, 46 miles so you basically add about four miles to all the numbers that you saw in the half hour video. But here's where it gets interesting, at least to me. Both of these pictures were taken with the same camera. Now, if you remember from the half-hour Chicago skyline video, I was saying... I can, I can see Chicago. We're about 42 miles away. I can see it. The problem is trying to get the... The camera's having trouble focusing on it because it's moving up and down, and it's so zoomed in. But I can totally see it. Rick was not zoomed all the way in. He was using my camera, the Nikon Coolpix P900, but he was only zoomed in about halfway when he grabbed the shot above. Now, I know that when I got the image below, I was zoomed all the way in. And so some people may point to one of my videos where I was actually debunking myself. If you remember that uh, NASA video showing the uh, the Earth and the moon and the uh, the moon was going in front of the earth. So I did a little experiment where I used a baseball as a moon and a larger ball as the earth. And I got at the end of a long hallway with my Canon 70D and uh, zoom lens and zoomed all the way in on it. And uh, this was the image that I captured 
doing this experiment. There's the NASA image on top, and there's my image. And so, you know, just by virtue of the, the lens, it it does magnify the distant object to make it look proportionately large to the object that is uh, closer to you. So is that what's happening here? Well, uh, both these images were shot from the harbor area here. The red line at the top is where we were in the boat. We're just about to depart when I asked uh, Tony to stop and I got the camera out to shoot Chicago. And the uh, lower red line is where we were on the beach when I took the picture on the bottom there. So, and the distance between those two locations is less than a quarter of a mile. So it's, it's negligible. We're still looking about 46 miles across either way. Now, here's the shot uh, from the beach before I zoomed in. Now I'm zooming in, zooming in, zooming in, and I'm going to stop it right about here. That's about halfway on the zoom, and I believe that's where Rick had the camera set when he took the picture above, based on the size of the building right here. I'm going to guess that he was about halfway. All right, so let's go ahead and continue the zoom. And this is zoomed all the way in. The Nikon Coolpix P900 has an 83 power optical zoom, and that little punch in right after that was the digital zoom afterward. Uh, it has a digital zoom that goes beyond the 83 power. I did not go all the way in with that. I just punched it a little bit uh, because I wanted to frame it with the ship right there. So that's 83 power plus. So I'm going to guess it's probably the equivalent of about maybe 90. 90 power zoom or so right here. Now let's bring the picture in from the halfway zoom and I'm gonna go ahead and bring our car back in and slide the picture in from Chicago and I'm gonna scale the car to the appropriate size to the boat right here and go ahead and slide the car over to the building. So this is what the car in the building look like at half zoom. So let's try something else here. I'm going to unfreeze the video and back it off so it goes backwards and we're zooming out back to the shoreline and now I'm gonna bring it forward again and let's see right about here is where we have some fairly decent resolution where you can still make out the building I'm gonna zoom in here with the computer this is a computer zoom right now on this still image and I'm going to bring the other image in from the half zoom and scale the car over to uh, the digitally zoomed in image of the almost completely zoomed out shot. And uh, so you got three different zooms here. One almost completely zoomed out, one zoomed about halfway on an 83 power optical zoom lens, and uh, the one on the right, of course, all the way zoomed in. Uh, with a little touch of digital zoom on top of that in the camera. And when looking at these images compared to the one on the left, which is just shot with my iPhone, I, I'm, I gotta tell you, it looks like it's being magnified to me. Especially when you consider the fact that that building is like 45 miles away from that boat. It's 45 miles away. So... <laughs> Looks like there's some serious magnification going on here. And, you know, some of that could be due to the lens. I'll give you that. But I also know what I could see with my own eyes. Now, I understand you may not want to take my word for it, so all I can say is go up there and do it yourself. <laughs> but uh, based on my, what I saw with my own eyes, as well as what the quote-unquote experts had to say regarding how the atmosphere can act like a magnifying glass, I'm still going to go with it as being magnified. Again, you can go out there and test it for yourself. Initially, when I, uh, you know, a couple dollars, right, for a little magnifying glass and made this uh, cutout of, of a city with some scotch tape and I uh, put it on a table and, um, and I put my... I put my iPhone on the top of that uh, chair right there, which was pretty much even with the the surface right there. And then I'll, I, so I, that kept the camera like a dolly on the chair. And I pulled the chair back and wow, check it out. What do you know? Yeah, uh, I thought that touch was so cool. And, <laughs> that was so cool. Boom. Uh, and then in this part of the video, it's actually uh, 
Mr. S uh, Thrive and Survive, uh, Richard, t talking yeah. about, as a meteorologist, talking about how completely insane it was for this weatherman to call that a, a mirage. And, you know, he talks about it from a science perspective, why that's ridiculous. But then I show this footage right here uh, of Skunk Bay. And over time, you see, you know, th this part right here starts to disappear over time because of the atmospheric conditions and it gets warmer and stuff and cooler. Mm -hmm. And, it, and it, you know, right now you can see everything. But all of a sudden, you know, as the day progresses, it starts getting wavier and wavier and you start losing part of the, the, the buildings here and the mountain in the background stretches and stuff. You'll have to watch the whole thing. Uh, then I improved on that. Here's the, here's the experiment with the sheet. So I'm using the little, magnification sheet come right up on the city that's chicago i'm going to pull my camera back on the table and remember what the expert said the atmosphere really is acting like a lens right um, so and i'm going to do a comparison here and show you look at how much of the city is missing from the beginning wow. mm -hmm. the atmosphere that's much is, is missing wow mm -hmm. it's a curve of the table is what it it's is a curve of the <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm using their science. This is right. right. They're the ones that gave me the idea. I'm like, okay, well, if the atmosphere is acting like a lens, let's put a lens in front of the camera and see what happens. That's the you best know? weapon to use against their own, their own source. That whatever they say, the best stuff to use against them. I love it. But see, but see, the other good point to your experiment is that what happens with your small scale also happens in the larger scale. Physics is not affected by time, distance, or scale. So whatever you, what, whatever results you get with that experiment can legitimately happen in the real world. Right, right. Oh, Rob, that also, that also reminds me about sunsets in the desert. I don't know if you have that in your video, but yeah, the, the, the size- I, I the video too soon. Uh, I made a mistake. Um, I'll go ahead and keep playing it because I forgot that I, uh, I stopped it too quick, but here. So here's the experiment that I did with the. Yeah, that was the one I saw. I thought that was so cool. I said, <laughs> what? I remember watching it the first time. I said, no way. <laughs> the same compatible lens. Here's a simple example. The atmosphere really is like acting like a lens. Yes. <laughs> Man. That's not real, you faked it. <laughs> yep, that was it, that last one right there. So, that, yeah, that was the one that at the end of it, I showed the desert when there's, you know, um, less moisture. And it yeah. showed the, the sun mm -hmm. getting warm. People will argue, like Danny Faulkner will say, you know, pfft, they just did, they, you know, they didn't put a filter on the lens. And I understand the argument. There, there's some truth to that. You know, if you didn't have a polarizing lens and what have you on there, you know, um, you're or seeing. Or neutral density. Yeah, you're seeing the glare right. of the sun when it's higher. And as it's getting further away, that glare is diminishing. So I understand the argument. But I've also seen stuff that even with filters that, especially in those kind of conditions, it's mm -hmm. going to look smaller, um, mm -hmm. you know, and it also kind of makes this curve as it's as it's going, you know, right, right, kind of right. down. It's kind of doing a, a curve out on its circuit. So, but yeah. I mean, there's no problem with sunset, sunrise, and sunset. You know, between it's not just perspective. Yes, th there is the law of perspective. Certainly, is at play. Um, there's also the angular uh, acuity, you know, visual acuity of the eye. You know, our eye is a lens in and of itself. So the way we perceive things, that's all playing a part of it. But when you combine all of that with what's happening with the atmosphere acting like a lens itself, mm -hmm. there's no problem with sunrise and sunset, with the mm -hmm. sun coming and going, just as scripture says in the Hebrew. I, I thought it was funny their their experiment with the, you know looking out over water, how they were saying, you know, we put in so much effort. It's like 
You park one guy here, you went there, you with the camera. So <laughs> much, in the middle of the day, you know, in the middle of the day, and they're like, oh, look at that with all the humidity and stuff, and we're having a hard time seeing across there. It's like, no kidding. Why don't you do like actual people put in a lot of effort and go early in the morning, go in the <laughs> afternoon, go in the afternoon, go at different times of the year. You know, do actual research. You're like, duh, we're parked here. Right now we'll yeah. <laughs> they would have sat there all day and till the sun started to go down, miraculously all that haze will start to dissipate. And then it'll go down and mm -hmm. down and down. Ooh, there's the guy with the flag right there. How do I know? Because I've yep. done this stuff. And many of you guys have yeah. and I'm wearing the lab coat I have, so you can trust me, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad you got the white uh, lab coat on there, Chad. I'm, I'm looking at you. I feel much better. I feel much better. It's my bathrobe, but it's the closest thing I can find. <laughs> I, feel, I, feel I feel smarter just listening to you. Man. <laughs> I swear, these guys are either complete morons and did no research on all these topics. Oh. Yeah. Or they are deliberately lying, like Chris said. It's one or the other because the 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 amount of research that they obviously would have done to be as ignorant as they are and as ignorant as they come across is mind boggling. The yeah, arguments yeah. and things that they're putting forward are idiotic, yeah, and it yeah. pisses me off that they're they're actually have the guts to put this kind of stuff out there. And right, it's uh, it's that's why that's why we need to hit back. Like Rob was you know um, mentioning before, we've got to put together a, a thorough documentary. You know putting this out there the biblical earth the model and really touch on all of this the science the the biblical verses and i mean what are they going to do what are they going to do to come back you know to actually tackle that they're going to have to actually do research they're going to have to actually tackle all these other scriptures rather than just sideline them that was pretty right. much for someone that just comes to it for the first time and they're like i trust these guys yeah flat earth is pretty silly but right. again there is no real research but i think it's important that we all kind of do that come together put something out there because these are the things that people are going to look to you know for a long time saying you know what do people believe when it comes to the biblical literal take of creation and we have one comprehensive you know documentary or whatever out there that goes through everything all that nonsense they did we don't even have to touch on because we know already it's been debunked, right? We already know right. it's silly arguments. So let's let's touch on that, how silly that is, like Rob does when he's like debunking Flat Earth 101, right? All that silliness, we'll have that in the documentary and say, look, this is all nonsense. Let's get to the hard facts here so people will realize that a lot of these argumentations they're using um, are absolutely silly and it is ridiculous. It's like they're lazy, like you said. They could be lazy, they could be really dumb, or it's intentional. But again, when they're saying that all of this attention of flat earth is to try to take their ministries down, there could be nothing further from the truth. We're just calling them. We're just calling them to take account. Are you willing to take a stand on the word of God rather than saying, well, we take two uh, creation versus literal, but all other 250, that's allegory. It doesn't work that way, guys. If you're going to say it's poetry and allegory, you can't even use those two verses. Get that off the table. So how do you know? How do you know when something's allegory? or a poetic or literal. The fact is, because it messes with their model, they're gonna to revert to allegory and poetry because again, it doesn't look good. How do you fit pillars in a globe? How do you fit, you know, all of these things that have a big problem. Um, that's why they're dismissing them as allegory. So I think at some point we need to put out some comprehensive documentary because again, as this explodes and as they mentioned, this is exploding, more and more Christians are coming to flat earth this is serious business. Well, mm -hmm. we need to actually show them exactly how serious of a topic this truly is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. They'll take six days. Literally, they'll take 6,000 years, literally, but they won't take the hundreds and thousands of times up, down, above, below, descend, mm -hmm. ascend. They won't take those literally. Those are all allegories. Mm -hmm. apparently. Right. 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 So, uh, yeah. anyway, <laughs> I'm off my soapbox. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm with you. This was a this was a DVD meant for the, the the bookshelf at the Creation Museum. That's what it was. Is mm -hmm. oh, don't worry, all this crazy flat Earth stuff. You know, the Bible doesn't say that. Yeah. Now come check out our hundred million dollar ark. You know, we, yeah. Look, I, I'm. That I is applaud. totally inaccurate, by the way. Well, I applaud the effort. I mean, this that was actually a dream I had when, back in the '90s. I actually laid out a whole blueprint for my idea for a, a water park that would have a life-size arc and you know the whole thing so you know i i applaud their effort in all of that and and actually support what they're trying to do with that but you Me know too. look 
if you're going to take the claim to take the Bible literally, especially if you're going to claim to be a creation ministry, I mean, the guys that put this video out call themselves the creation guys, and then <laughs> come around and deny the creation. Okay, I mean, okay, evolution is important to come against, but evolution is not even remotely plausible <laughs> unless you insert the spinning heliocentric globular Copernican right. model right. in the first place. Right. I mean, well, you, the, you destroy that. That's the foundation upon which evolution yes. was built. So yes. they, they're well, not going far enough back. I mean, they do a great job of taking the Bible <coughs> literally throughout the, 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 you know, from like day uh, five forward, you know, five, six, and yeah. seven, well, even yeah. seven they throw out because they're not about the Sabbath. So you're just like, you got five and six. That's it. Okay. Five and six. <laughs> <laughs> you, you should just claim to be a. a a, 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 a chapter, chapter one verse. You just call yourself a day five and six creationist. Okay, that's it. <laughs> day five. <laughs> remember, remember what they said though, which was really striking, is they said that we know that Noah's Ark is literal because it's historic, it's history. Creation is right. not. I thought that was really interesting when they said, "Look, that we know that this isn't literal because it's not history. It's not history. It's the foundations in the beginning, right?" So, like you said, Rob, they're going back. But yet they stop at a certain point and be, it doesn't become history anymore. So obviously there wasn't a sequence of events that led up to Noah's Ark. But that's what they say. They pick and choose. But these are the creation guys. These guys yeah. should be standing on creation. They should be actually standing on the word of God and saying, God created this way. I don't understand it. But he said it this way and just go with it. But they don't. It's unbelievable. Right. It's unbelievable. You know, right. And I want to I say, you know, going further back. If you look at the creation account, let's look at the first two days, okay? Two whole days. I mean, we think about life on this earth and, you know, the diversity of plant, animal, human, fish, you know, th there's an immense amount of diversity and, and complexity to life on this earth. So I think it's amazing when you focus on the days that life was created and, you know, things on earth were created. That's amazing. But look at the first two days. It took two entire days of creation you know one entire day was just dividing light okay mm -hmm. god let there be light and there was yeah. light god saw light it was good god divided the light from the darkness god called the light day and the darkness called night and the evening and morning for you really it took a whole day just to do that <laughs> when you consider you know what he did on other days you know when you consider the vast amount of life forms on this earth and you know that were created uh, you know on like day three and whatnot um mm -hmm. That, and then it took the entire second day to make the firmament. Mm -hmm. God mm -hmm. said, look, yeah. be a firmament in the midst of the water, let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, divide the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so, and God called the firmament heaven. And even more on a second day, an entire day was devoted to pounding out this firmament thing. An entire day. And then when you read Psalm 19, verse one, it says the firmament, the, you know, it talks about the firmament declaring his handiwork. Like, this is important to God. Why? His throne is sitting on top of this thing. So as yeah. soon as you dismiss the firmament and write it off as to ether, you know, they don't even say ether, air, no. air the vacuum of space. Right. They literally say nothing. They're saying nothing. They, yeah. they, they're right. they have taken something that God considers extremely important. It declares his handiwork and, and who he, interesting that Werner von Braun has that on his tombstone of all things. <laughs> um the firm is a big deal, guys. Like, this is huge. The throne of God is yeah. sitting on top of this thing. Yeah, right. And he devoted yeah. an entire day to its creation. And these creation ministries, these creation guys, just want to completely dismiss it and call it the vacuum of space, the expanse. Mm -hmm. That's I don't understand how people don't see the intimacy behind the design and what he did by looking at what the scriptures say. Right. He made something really special for us. So that's That's the bottom yeah. line. Um, you know, I don't know about you guys, but if somebody, you know, who was it that put this video out? Who was it? The creation guys. The creation yeah. guys. Yeah. Okay. All I'm going to say is if somebody, like, say one of you guys called me and said, hey, we're going to have a get together and we're going to watch this video and then we're going to talk about the video when it's over with. I'm like, okay, what's the video about? Oh, it's something uh, these guys called the Grill Masters made it. Oh, well, what is it? Well, they said they're going to, you know, serve up some awesome steaks. All I can tell you is after that two hours, I feel like somebody handed me a box of Twinkies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because, it, you know, it was sweet. It was fun. It was packaged nice. But I'll tell you what, when it comes right down to it, uh, it could cause a cavity. 
Yeah. I mean, these guys, yeah. they were lamenting. They're saying the flat earth movement moves, uh, does not, they were saying the flat earth movement takes away from the glory of God and it diminishes Christ. No way. Yeah. No okay. Way. Yeah. It yeah. says that the firmament declares his glory, who he is, right. what he did. Right. You guys are the ones that are diminishing the word yeah. of God and what God himself right. declared important uh, right. by by turning the firmament firmament into nothing. Yeah, literally, right. nothing. Right. I love it. I love it how they always accuse people of sin. They're saying you guys need to focus on the gospel. And Creation Ministries made their entire ministry about creation, and yet they'll point their fingers and say, you need to focus on the gospel. This is the distraction. This is the biz of. I'm sorry, but that is such a double standard. Oh, my goodness, man. Oh, my goodness. It's from the creation guys. And, like, answers in Genesis. These flat earthers need to focus on the gospel. You do, too, then. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah. Ken Hovind's entire ministry. You know, he's I know. The notes I took is uh, one of the guys, that, I think it was Victor, said, God never said spread, uh, uh, or, or uh, God never said, um, go preach flat earth. Right. Have we ever said that? No. Have we ever no. said that's part of the gospel? No. No. But what, what, are we not supposed to expose the lies of the enemy and know the schemes of Satan so that we don't get taken by the schemes mm -hmm. and are mm -hmm. we not supposed to expose the darkness are we not supposed to to tell the truth in all things are we not mm -hmm. supposed to say hey guys ding 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 i don't know how many millions of students are out there in the public school system but from the time that you're playing with cardboard bricks making houses in kindergarten you also had a globe there telling you that you came from nothing yeah. You came from nothing. Even Neil deGrasse Tyson will tell you that if you go to space, you can't have an explosion unless you take a can of oxygen with you. Right. Which means if you can't have a small explosion, you can't have a big bang. But we get right. graded on it. We get graded on it for 13 years of our life in school, from kindergarten to 12th grade. You are getting graded on it. If you don't follow the indoctrination system, you're going to keep it. You're, they're going to keep you in the system until you get it right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. And this is what we're up well, against. He, here's what got, I want to say, got, guys. Got, oh, go ahead, Chris. Well, I, I just, you know, you know, knowing what Danny Faulkner is, um, you know, had, you know, he's a, uh, you know, uh, astronomy uh, head of that head of that department, um, well astute in the heliocentric model, which all of these creation ministries are. Let's not fool ourselves; they are astute in the heliocentric model. Now, now, uh -huh. this is what was so important: is they they tried to draw this back to the relationship with, mm. and here's here is the the sad reality of the fact in the heliocentric model. It is primary and foundational that the earth was formed from the young sun. That means mm -hmm. that the sun mm -hmm. is vital to come first. Mm -hmm. You can't have it the other way around. Mm -hmm. In that model, the earth is formed from the solar nebulas of the sun. Okay. This, de this is a total mockery of the opening statement of the, the, the Bible, the book that you claim to have faith in and believe in, and you can't believe it when it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Right. You can't even get to that point. And so here's the problem. We're talking about Christ, and they, they talk about how this is... Um, uh, contrary to faith in Christ, and and they made it very clear in their in their that this is clouding it. Even though they said this isn't a salvational issue, they made it a salvational issue. But I will be very clear in saying this: that Genesis one one is correlated in John one one, the Logos, the one who created it all. And if your model takes away and 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 takes away Genesis one. One, you might as well throw away John one one at the same exact time, Great. because they speak of the same thing at the right time, and and this is so vital and so important. And I know so many people out there say, "Well, I believe the Earth came first. I'm heliocentric, but I believe the Earth came first. You, no, you're not heliocentric. You, you, neither you're not you're not pseudoscience. You're not scientific, 
and you're not biblical. You don't have a biblical model to stand on or a scientific model to stand on. You have your own skewed version. These creation ministries have their own skewed version that is mocked by the Bible and it's mocked by science because the science will tell you that they're irreconcilable. And so mm -hmm. that is what's so important. I don't understand why guys like Danny Faulkner, these heliocentric men, that's why I can at least respect guys like uh, Dr. Sengenis and, and all of this geocentric movement because they understand that the earth came first. It is extremely vital that the earth comes before the sun, but yet it's 100% backwards when we have the sun being formed first. And yet they aren't telling you this in this documentary. They aren't telling you this. So continue believing this lie. When you can't even believe the opening statement in the Bible. And that's all I got to say on that because that is so important, so vital. And uh -huh. uh, if you believe that he is the Logos and he is the creator, then you bar might as well start believing it and start with Genesis 1-1 because it speaks exactly of him. Uh -huh. I mean, they use, they uh -huh. use, fear, they use fear and they use fear and intimidation in there that any Christian dare even look into flat earth. You know what I mean? They yep. use fear and intimidation. And I, can, I believe that was absolutely wrong on their behalf. If they had actually reached out and talked to us, we could have had a cordial conversation, respectful conversation, and showed them, look, we're pointing to the gospel, right? We're, we're looking at it in proper context, but they made it look like this is dangerous. Do not touch it because you know what? You are actually blaspheming Christ. You're actually not getting a good understanding. Of, of God and also your salvation might be in jeopardy because at the beginning of the movie they said that you might go far off into worse things because you're believing yeah. this and yeah. I thought huh. that was very very dishonest of them telling okay. you know people that and I know like I know Nathan Thompson is gone now but he said that early on he used to question why in the world I don't believe in a God because why would a God put millions and trillions and billions of miles of space between me and him Right. Mm -hmm. He realized he realized the uniqueness of the fact that if God really loved us like a relationship, you want to be close to someone. You wouldn't mm -hmm. put someone 18 trillion light years away from <laughs> from them. And because, again, you know, God is is, you know, omnipresent. The fact is we're not. And we understand that context that if he is trillions or billions of light years away, you know, he feels very distant, you know, just to people just understanding the space paradigm. The fact is God created it. In such a way that's unique he looks right down on us he's very close and personal with his creation and this whole heliocentric big bang you know cosmology is creating that distance and i believe that's part of satan's plan not only to eradicate god but also distance him you know even making him further where you're like how, where where is heaven where you know where is hell mm -hmm. i mean there's no up and down like chad was mentioning distorting even up and down every culture that's the that's the difference. Noah, like Noah, understood up and down, just like we understand up and down. It's never changed. Mm -hmm. Technology changes, but we've always humanity has always understood up and down. Mm -hmm. Give it to Satan to twist up and down, just like he's twisting male and female. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, right. Just simple, right. simple concepts like that. Satan will actually twist something so fundamental to all civilizations male and female he'll twist it where i don't know what i am maybe there's more than two sexes you know again he's doing the same thing which is simple up and down and understanding how close god is and that he's right above us yeah yeah hey, hey listen guys i'm gonna have to bug out but it was great uh carrying the stage with you thanks for having me on man i got see you no thanks for being here i'm on yeah I got <laughs> well we got rob out of retirement tonight <laughs> yeah. I, got, yeah. I, got, I need to get back to, to the seed bunker here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Take care, Ryan. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video presentation. If you did, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, like the video, and share it on your favorite social media sites. There's a lot more to come, so stay tuned, and we'll see you back next time.